Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Miguel Iterate back here on the Lights Out Podcast, and we're back. A very special episode here. I'm pumped up. We got the MMA detective, Mike Davis, as always here, ready to guide us through another MMA career, another deep dive, Mike, and... This is episode 100, so we're in heady territory here. For 50, we did something special. We had Chris, uh, you know, reveal to us, you know, his career. What are we doing for 100? What do we do for an encore, man? We got Bas Root. So Bas was our first interview. It's a solid interview, but it doesn't follow the same process that we have today. And, you know, our first 15 interviews are, I mean, they're good, they're solid, but they're not what it is that we're doing today. And we just thought, you know what, in this one, we're going to have to do a redo. And, you know, Boss is a special guy. We're going through his pancreas years. So we're going to talk about his Japan years. We will not touch the UFC. And, you know, we're definitely going to mix in. If you've listened to our Gilbert Evel or Marlos Conan interviews, you know that Dutch scene is really shady. And we're going to be hitting him with some questions from that Dutch scene that I doubt he's ever been asked before. Yeah, well, we'll see what comes up there. You know, I got a feeling that a lot of that, you know, what happens in Holland stays in Holland kind of thing. That's like <laughs> not a lot of people talking there. And I think it was a rugged, like a rugged, like, you know, scene that played, you know, the legal and the illegal side of things, you know, they, you they keep saying both, you know they play both so. sides well they play both sides right so yeah. there was some definitely some characters in there but i don't know how much anyone's ever going to sit down and and tell you the whole story if anyone's capable of doing that it's going to be boss though so we'll we're going to get there about. we're going to get there we're going to get there and you know we keep chipping away and i i think boss is probably going to be a little more candid about it than the people that actually still live in that country um but in essence what you have is you have a lot of fights going on inside the ring. And then the administrative people were really positioning and they were going to drastic measures in order to make sure that they got what it is that they wanted. It is a crazy, insane scene. And we're going to touch on it in this interview. Without further ado, here comes Chris Vidal and Boss Root and a pair of Pancreas veterans. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for following us and uh, sharing all that stuff. Uh, deep dive time again, man. This is our favorite thing we do. Uh, man, 100th episode. Can you believe it already? We got 100 of these good episodes, deep dives. Um, I'm loving it. And we got a special guest. This is, uh, man, when I first started fighting over in Japan, 1999, I believe. Um, this guy was a legend over there already. Um it's just, uh, I remember getting to go hang out with him once. It's like, man, it was, it was a definitely a big deal. But he, he was like that for a reason, especially when we, we break down his fights and figure out uh, his amazing story and how he, he got to where he is. Uh, boss, boss, man, how the hell are you, man? Boom! I'm doing freaking <laughs> awesome, my friend. Just came back <laughs> from, uh, from Europe, which was a little cold. So I'm back, happy, happy to be back in the States here in California. What part of you was it back home? Were you back in uh, the Netherlands? Yeah, I went first to uh, to Hungary, and from there I went to the, the visit the family. Uh, you know, my mom had a stroke, so she's in a, in a different place now. So it's kind of hard on my dad. And but you know, she was doing really well when I came. You know, was, she recognized me right away, so that was all good. And she was in a happy space, so that's a good thing. God bless. So so so, boss. You know, I. I We've talked to you before. Um, really wanted to get a, a more deep dive in your career, though, because it's so fascinating to us. Um, and I can't remember if I talked about this last time, but um, you know, obviously you were you were a, a kickboxer starting off. You went into obviously MMA. Uh, what did you do anything else before kickboxing? Were you a soccer player? Uh, I know that's really big over in the Netherlands. Everything is big over like soccer is really big in Europe. What all did you play? I, I was track and field. I was never a big team sporter. I always liked to do myself. So decathlon, that was it. Believe mm. it or not, what I always said, I, if you know, uh, I wanted to be the, I was a huge fan of Bruce Jenner. I wanted to be the, the, the Dutch Bruce Jenner. Yeah, it is. You know, so, he was the 1976 decathlon Olympic gold medal. Oh, yeah. So, 
So he was an animal and uh, I was hard on my way. It, uh, everything went really well, but then my tendonitis, something that stopped my fighting career later in life, somehow it uh, started flaring up after six years of doing mixed martial arts. But that actually stopped when I go back in time, my, uh, my, my track and field career, so to say. I was still young, but I was doing really well. What was your what was your best part of the uh, decathlon? What was your what were you best at? I was good at high jump, long jump, discus, shot put, javelin. Uh, I would say those five were my best. Needless need to say, I was a severe asthma patient, so the like the eight hundred, the four eight, 1500 were not that great for me. Yeah. But uh, you know, yeah. I was already starting to pole vault. I, I was doing a, a lot of. I was young. I was still young, but I jumped. My high jump was six. Six seven, I believe, when I was wow, well, six. What is it? Uh, two meters and one centimeter, yeah, whatever that is in uh, in inches because it's all, but it's around that, uh, yeah. And, and that was when it's when I was 16, so it was going good, man. So, how, how did that transition over? You're like, I'm tired of this, I want to punch somebody. How did you get into the gym and start kickboxing and then? From, from pole vaulting <laughs> being being an, uh, an, an, uh, a severe asthma patient and that goes many times with many other other kids have that too hand in hand with eczema which, which is skin disease and i had with severe asthma so i had to wear gloves and, and, and because of that i got in my neck and in my ears and i got bullied uh, uh. and that will yeah after a certain amount of time you know i watching a bruce lee movie real enter the dragon realizing if i'd be like that guy I could change myself, and that's how I started training. And I, to, I was uh, taken under the wing taekwondo by the tough guy who was dating my neighbor girl, uh, Xavier was his name. Um, and he, I was the only kid with the adults training. And, and within months, I started beating some of the adults, not, of course, the black belts, but I started dropping people there. The people were laughing in the dressing room. Man, did you see that kid boss? And he knocked out so-and-so. I was 14, you know? <laughs> and when you hear only bad things about you, but then suddenly adults start actually speaking highly of you, that gave me a boost, got into my first street fight until the day, still the closest fight to my heart with a guy named Shaki. He was the biggest bully in my school. And uh, they surrounded me with uh, friends on the bikes and uh, challenged me. So I knocked him out in one punch. And it was, it was insanity. <laughs> Changed my life overnight. Suddenly the bullying stopped everybody because he was the guy, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the problem was the police showed up because they broke his nose. <clears throat> she had to go to the doctor at the hospital. So then my mom and dad took me off right away. I always have to say this, my mom and dad didn't know. I was um, I was bullied. I wanted to shield that away from my mother. She had extre a lot of work with me. The whole family would send it, send in old bed sheets, we'd rip them up to bandages. And every night she needed to mummify me, is what we called it, with all the creams. Mm. They would rip off in the middle of the night and then I had to do it again. So she had a lot of work with me and I didn't want to bother her by saying that I was bullied on top of it. Because I know my mother, she's a sweetheart, but. She came to school one time with a broomstick when 11 kids were waiting for me. So, yeah, she'll <laughs> check. <laughs> now, let me ask you, though, at some point, because we know it now, you're an amazing athlete, right? But at some point, like, when was the first time you heard, you said you were practicing a lot of sports at 14? Like, when was the first time you heard, wow, boss is an athlete, like, natural or a natural, whatever? Oh, listen, I was always the kid that got casted out, but at G with school, with dodgeball, whatever we had, I was the first kid to get picked. So I was always a good athlete. I was skinny and very athletic, but we come from a, a family of athletes. My dad, the track and field, his, his brothers are, are gymnasts, and we got, you know, and it's so my brother and I were automatically, we were, I was, I was also, I was in the trees. This sounds weird, but since I had no friends, I was spending three, four hours every single day in the trees. I had this whole path that I go through a forest that we had in a back home. And uh, I, I had like maybe three or four spots, four spots where I had to come down because the, the leap was too big. But for the rest, I was swinging from treetop to treetop, which is great <laughs> to, to avoid bullies as well, you know? <clears throat> so, but I think my athleticism comes from all that jumping and slamming. I was climbing high buildings. I've been crazy. Uh, I was... Uh, <laughs> The street lights, I was hanging always at the top, you know, like doing crazy stuff. Every roof, every church, every big building in my town, I climbed it. You know, I was at the wow. top. I always looked for that. What do they call that now? Parkour? It's like parkour. They parkour. Yeah. Yeah. That that I wouldn't do. I wouldn't be that crazy. But, you know, I had some crazy freaking dives to uh, from uh, from one tree to another tree that I'm still thinking. <laughs> not that. that was a very close one. <clears throat> So why don't we start with, uh, I mean, we obviously know Boss is very accomplished in mixed martial arts. 
But why don't we start with his roots of kickboxing? You had a really interesting fight with Rene Ruse. But yeah, Ruse. <laughs> an absolutely filthy fighter, probably top five filthy fighters. It, it, it's it, it's strange. Like your neck of the woods, you had Dirty Bob Schreiber, you had Gilbert <clears throat> Gerdo, you had or uh, Gerdo, you had Evel, you had Who's. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what's in the water there with dirty fighters, but yeah. like in a top ten, you guys probably have five spots. <laughs> You know, yeah, and that that could be a low number. There's some crazy guys out there. I don't know. I don't know what's. Uh, it's got to be because. Oh, that's so funny that you mentioned that. All these guys come from the top of Holland, not from the place where I come from. So at least that's a good thing. <laughs> but I'm sure, I'm sure we have them too. <laughs> so Rene Roos, do you remember that kickboxing fight? <laughs> oh, how can you forget? It was the craziest thing ever. Um, so what happened was. Um, I started fighting him and I, I just destroyed him the first round, but he's a very tough guy. And he brought with him, I brought all my bouncer friends from the south of Holland and he brought his friends, were, which were the Hells Angels and other people from the north of Holland. And, um, and we were at the event and everybody's screaming and everything. Said, and so in the second round, because I think he's on the losing end, in the clinch suddenly he bites my ear and he's lashing on to it. And I'm telling him to let go. Let go, let go. And then you see me knee, but lift my knee up and I knee him as hard as I can in the balls. And I yeah. want to see him, but the referee picks me off and the whole audience starts fighting. I mean, everybody gets, uh, <laughs> and one guy throws, this is so funny. I'm trying to look for that video because I have seen the video. I know it's out there, but it's very hard to find. One guy throws a plastic chair. It bounces on Core Hammers, who is my trainer, Robin Dexter's coach on his back. It falls behind me. I don't see. The only thing, I'm, you see me in the center of the ring. Everybody's fighting. And I'm looking, I look behind me, and I see a chair. So I sit in the chair in the middle of the ring. <laughs> you know, everybody's fighting. And then the whole, the, the referee runs to me. and said, why would you do that? I go, dude, he bit my ear. And then he said, he, he bit clean through my ear. So he grabbed the microphone. And he said, oh, well, again, I have attention. I said, well, boss is actually right. Because, and then he, he showed me, he says, he's got a hole straight through his ear. From him, so then everybody calmed down because they knew it wasn't me; it was actually him doing a jab. But that was a crazy, that was a freaking crazy uh, experience there to see everybody fight. And of course, so, the, 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 our, our our guys did the best. <laughs> so this was this was before the Mike Tyson bit uh, Van Holyfield zero off, wasn't it? Oh yeah, Ray. How can we don't hear about this? Oh, yeah. we hear about mm -hmm. Mike Tyson. We mm -hmm. hear about this one. Yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. It was, uh, and he was known for that. He was, uh, you know, like Bob, like not so bunch of fighters that we have. These they're simply known to do that. And uh, but I didn't know he was going to do it with me because I knew him a little bit. But uh, hey, he paid the price. I got to do what I got to do. You know, to do something, got to do it back big. You got to do it back better. That's what I was saying. It's but right. Was there a lot yeah. of bad blood going into that fight, or was it a really hyped up fight? Because you were big from the yeah. south, he's big from the north. Was there a lot of animosity, or what? No, I never had that. I always tried to avoid that also. What a fun thing was, though, was many years later, and, and for the people at home, notice is legal, right? Not in Germany. So but my German uh, family members in Germany uh, came over to, uh, to buy uh, some kilos of hash. And I know these people who are selling it. And I go, uh, and, uh, and that went through Rene Rosa. So when we walk in, there are all these bikers, and everybody's looking at us both, and they start laughing and go like, First, you guys beat the shit out of each other in the ring, and now he's selling you the goods. It was hilarious. <laughs> so, yeah, that was great. But like I said, it's completely legal over there, so it's nothing. That's funny. That's funny. That's good. So like, I knew your right second, away. You, you, one second, Miguel. So your second bout of note is your European Muay Thai title fight against Frank Loebman. Yeah. That also had some interesting backstory to it. Well, listen, I stopped uh, Thai boxing. I was an, uh, a crazy Thai boxer. I was very explosive, uh, very technical until somebody would hit me and then I would go crazy. And I simply, because I could overpower them, I, I knocked them out. But if I would face a really good guy, so I won like nine fights all by knockout. Um, and then people, would, because this was before uh, social media, I would train for six weeks and would show up at an event and then they would see it's me and they wouldn't fight me. And it happened twice in a row. And I say, you know what? I, uh, I'm going to stop with this because it's, it's not working. I'm going to go I do the smartest thing ever. I'm going to become, become a bouncer. So <laughs> I became a bouncer, start making money.
money with that, but I'm doing this now for two and a half, three years. And we're going, we, our, our club closes at 5 a.m. in the morning and then we go to the after club. So you know exactly what's going on. There's oh. drugs, there's everything, everything that you should not do, you're doing it there. So I'm in the middle of all that crap. I'm up and down. I'm doing everything bad. <clears throat> and then at an event at New Year's Eve, I'm standing as a bouncer. I had a few drinks also. And, um, and, and, and a promoter walks up to me and he says, uh, apparently, he said, do you want to fight Frank Lobman? So fast forward, like two months forward, I get a phone call from that guy. And he tells me, hey, where do we send the posters to? I said, what posters? He goes from the fight. I said, who's fighting? He says, you. I said, me? Who am I fighting? And he goes, Frank Lobman. I go, the animal. That was his nickname. And he goes, yeah. I go, when did I say that? He says, at New Year's Eve. And I go, shit, did I, you know? And then I started thinking, I, yeah, I did see, okay, well, okay, now I better own up. When is the fight? It was like three weeks, three and a half weeks later. So this is two and a half years of me doing any drug possible out there with crazy drinking, with completely insanity, and I had three and a half weeks to train. I have to say, in defense of Frank Lobman as well, if I had six weeks to train or two months to train, he was a good fighter. I a good bit was going to be a bad problem for me. So... Um, I'm going to the fight just before what happened with him because there's just two of them. The two, of the, I had an, uh, oh, an, um, um, a, a hole in my shin bone. I was, we were somewhere at, a, at an auto auction and I was, I was always, I could jump very high. So I could stand in front of a, a wall here and from, from my standing, I could jump on that from this height <laughs> with my feet on it. So I showed it one time to a guy and they go, oh my God, did you see him do this? But it was raining a little bit. And so I did it again, and my toe slipped off the side, and I hit my shin bone on the stone, and it pulled a freaking hole in my shin. Like the skin came off. You know, literally see my shin bone. So I go, shit, the, the, like the fight is next week. Now what? And they said, no, don't worry about it. We'll fix this up. So they stitch it up and put makeup on it, you know? So the athletic commission didn't see it. And, well, you know, we're, okay, we're there. But my knee is, oh, but it's hurting. And I go like, ah, I need something, you know, for the pain. Can you put some lidocaine shots around it? And the guy goes, no, no, no. I got something better. We'll do it in your butt so that your whole leg gets uh, less painful. I go, sure, whatever you want to do. I thought he's a professional. And when you watch that fight also, because I'm always standing still, but in the fight, I'm constantly jumping and I'm shaking my leg. I go, what is going on with my leg? So I did, listen, I was going to get uh, stopped anyway because I was not in shape, <clears throat> but it was not what I said it was because I literally slept. It didn't even connect if you see the fight. I'm on the ground. I'm talking to my corner. I go, I can't stand. My leg is not working. You know, and we're talking, and then they waved the fight off. But it was, they said, oh, you got knocked out, but you can see at the fight. I don't think he even hit me. It was just me dropping, and I couldn't, uh, and I'm talking to my corner, but I couldn't, I couldn't use my leg anymore. But again, I have to say, I, he was just a really good guy. If I would have had a full training camp, I probably would still have lost. Wow. Wow. Well, that's kind of, you know, the era. And from there, you transition to Japan where you fight Ryushi Yanigawa on September 21st, 1993, on the very first pancreas. Yeah. What's up, Miguel? Miguel, yeah, I, yes. I, I have a question for you because you, you hinted at some of the street connections and some of the street, you know, action there in, in Amsterdam, and that, you know, it's a free-for-all when you get down there. You know what I mean? Yep. A lot of people from that scene... We're already fighting in Japan or doing pro wrestling or doing rings and stuff like that. Yep. It was, how was your connection to get there or were you known going through kickboxing connection? That was, you know, like, so Chris Dolman, he was from the organization of rings. We used to do this. Okay. So after I lost against Frank Lopman, um, I think, I believe I had that fight against Rene Rose and it was after that, I believe. Or was it just, no, yeah, it was afterwards because that was the reason I started fighting again. Um, and then uh, the, the backlash I got from the people after the Lobman fight, you see, I always said he couldn't fight. So they completely tore me up. And I said, I don't want to fight in Holland anymore. You know, if the people are like that, I knock nine guys out and then I lose a fight and now suddenly I'm the worst fighter. I, I don't need this crap. And especially after three, three and a half weeks training, don't want to do it anymore. But what we still wanted to do something in martial arts. And I, by my former Taekwondo coach, who was a badass, also great kicking, uh, powerful kicking. Uh, we did these shows where pumped up bodies, we come in the middle of the night, at midnight, the, the light goes down in the, in the, in the, in the disco or whatever you want to call it, the nightclub. And then we come up the dance floor with backflips and we do these crazy stuff and we do these choreographed fight scenes. And we started going, 
doing this more and more and more. And then we start doing it in advance, in the break, You're like a Thai boxing event. And in the break, we will do a show. And then suddenly Dutch TV asked us, and then European TV asked us. And we start traveling through Europe and we start doing these shows everywhere. And on one of these shows, Chris Dobbin was there and I was coming up with backflips and on the somersaults, you know, that's the way we would go to the ring. And he stopped me afterwards. He says, dude, I, we do this thing in Japan. It's called free fighting, he said. I know you from Thai boxing. I saw you destroying these guys. Now I see you doing backflips and somersaults. I think this could be really good for you. So that was the connection. Um, then I trained there once or twice, but Amsterdam is far away from where I live. Uh, I had an injury here and there. And then one day, Chris Dolman called me. And it was really weird because I never picked up the phone. And my phone, my answering machine was broke. Somehow I picked up and he said, jump in the car right now. Uh, because there's this new organization, Pancras, and they're looking for fighters, they're scouts, two scouts, Funaki Suzuki were there. And I go over there and I got in a rumble with, uh, with uh, one of his fighters and it led to me kicking him in the head <clears throat> and he needed a bunch of stitches. And that was it, they, they were pointing at me. And, and another reason they said was because I could jump over the ropes, you know, I would stand in front of the ropes and I would jump over them into the ring. And they thought it was so magnificent that that was actually also <laughs> one of the reasons not to knock out, but that that uh, <laughs> that they picked me, and that was it. Suddenly, I was in Japan fighting, and then oh, you know, in Japan, it became uh, for for Mike that that first fight that you just asked about. That's when everything like as a fighter, you have many times as a fighter, um, and you know this as well, Chris. You, you have fighters are really good at the gym, but they can't really bring it that same game to the fight. You know, we know a lot of guys who can actually work so oh. about world champions. But you put them under pressure in front of an audience and suddenly they freeze and they can't fix. Now, I was kind of like that in Thai, in thai boxing. Not, I wouldn't freeze, but I would just destroy. But my th- I, I wasn't like I was in the gym. In the gym, nobody could touch me. I was really, but I didn't bring that game yet. I was just aggressive. And I think it's emotions. It's just everything together. In Japan, the first time, it was everything in slow motion. I'm looking around, you see me go, what is going on? I was so calm. I heard everybody speak. The English people in the first row, I could understand what they were saying. And for the people at home, just know that it's completely quiet when you fight it. <laughs> and nobody says the words, very weird. And then I just, everything that went gone, it was, it, it, it was so fluid. There was this thing, and I'm talking about this, and I didn't do this on purpose. It was something in me. And I don't know if you have that too, Chris, there's two voices. The one voice says, go after now, now, now. And the other voice says, no, hold back, hold back. Just, you know, it's, uh, you're fighting these two guys the whole time. And there was one moment and, and it, it sounds super cool and it is super cool, but there's no way I did that. It was something else who did that. I remember I gave him a high kick and right away, because he was a taller guy than me, it was like six, five. And I palm strike him underneath the jaw and he goes down. But I see his eyes are open. And my one voice tells me, run to the corner, because that was an eight count. They had eight counts in, in Pancras. If you're in the corner, you give him less time to recoup, right? Because as soon as you hit the corner, that's when they start counting. But so the other voice tells me, no, 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 intimidation. And dude, I, I'm, there's no way how I do. So I look him in the eyes, and I stand still, and I give him a little stare, and I turn around very slowly, and I walk very slowly back to my corner. And that one voice is going, go fast, go fast, go fast. And the other guy's going to stay down. But you know, there's that fight in you. And I'm leaning on the ropes like it was nothing. But that was all on the outside. On the inside, there were this crazy shit went on. But I was so... And then I knocked him out after that. But everything I remembered, when I saw the video, uh, I could say, oh, he's opening with a kick. I'm going to block him with my shit. I, I, I remembered everything before uh, from the fight. I never had that in Thai boxing. And that was the first time in my life that I fought like I was fighting in the dojo. From that moment on, I, I think it was the weight difference. There was no weight classes. You know, I found it out on the day of the fight. And then I found out there was only one round and I'm all happy. And they go 30 minutes. I go, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I go, I have this big R. So I knew that if I unload like I did in Thai boxing, in the first minute and a half, and the Japanese are known to be tough, and I can't put them away. That's going to be a long 28 and a half minutes, you know. So that's why I think it calmed me more down. That together with the audience being completely silent, no stress on my head, it, uh, it changed me completely. Changed me. Well, let me let me frame this a little bit. So, uh, Yane Gasawa, he's from Team Dragon, a renowned pro wrestling gym in Japan. And he loses to Fanaki in his debut, but then he wins four in a row, including one over Vernon Tiger White. Yeah. Last, when you knocked him out with that palm strike, he spent three days in the hospital. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's very scary because I remember he didn't wake up in the beginning. Uh, and, and I told my wife, I was I spending a lot of money on my phone cards there. Uh, <laughs> because I was I was nervous you know I got like this guy was really nice he came to me shook my hand you know hey Mr. Very, very nice meeting you I said I don't want this you know if he's not going to come out this is it. I don't want to do this shit anymore you know so uh, yeah thankfully he came out he actually became a good friend of mine uh, I actually actually started he had to do a, a kickboxing match here in Holland and he was here for four weeks and I put him with my mom and dad and my mom mm. uh, fed him and did everything like she fed me when I was young so uh, he really liked it we went uh, uh, water skiing with all that that uh, crazy stuff yeah cool. very nice guy Thanks. I, I remember Yannick Azal he was he was a big guy but he was super cool man super helpful and just uh you go over there you were a little nervous and he was one of the guys who talked to you and be really cool man but uh, but that that's what you talk about over there they fought nothing but the best of the best a lot of those guys in Japan have a not great record but all they fought was tough every single time all jump, jump tapping the, I mean everybody they fought was really tough um I thought it was interesting, too, what you talked about. So true. Everybody who's been around the gym knows this. There's guys who are just, you know, you think UFC quality guys in the gym, but then they go out there and fight, and they find a way to lose. It's just amazing how that happens. But, boss, I've never really seen many people who get over that. You know, usually once that's in your head, it's in your head. You say yeah. that was kind of you in a way, but then after there's one fight in Japan that all went away. That's amazing, man. Most people who are like that, I never see them get out of it. That's just their gym, their club, their club fighters, their gym fighters are just not good. They they can't translate over to real fights. But you did it. That's amazing. Yeah, it's you know what, what the problem is. The more they lose, they they put too much pressure on themselves. I yep. found out. For me, the reason was, I was always bullied. I was always the kid, the nothing, the nothing, the nothing. So I want to prove myself, prove myself, prove myself. And then you you put too much pressure on yourself. You know, the family members are watching, and your friends are watching, and you need to win. You need to win. You need to win. If you just cast that out, and that's what I learned over there i didn't give a shit and also this is before social media you know this is not like you lose a fight and everybody attacks you you see an asshole that's you know unfortunately <laughs> these guys have that now to deal yeah. with but it was before so i didn't really care i was over in japan i was completely relaxed big difference you know i, I think the best thing ever happened to me you know you lose a really really big fight and then after that you can always say i've lost big fights in this and once you can calm down and you know, like you talk about I don't think anybody can understand the pressure involved with fighting and how, how it real it is. And if you can get past that, I think things are a lot better. You fight better, but pressure is a, a bitch, man. You, you deal with that. That's the biggest fight you're fighting. I think is dealing with pressure. It's always, you know, this is how I get my, my students uh, uh, calm. It's a great, a great, if you have a student who's very uh, uh, nervous, this is what I tell them. And it always works. I said like a week before the fight, they're nervous out and they're freaking out. And I go, okay, wait, let's stop this now. Imagine your, your opponent walks in right now and we're going to put you in that room and nobody's allowed. You lock the door and you fight him. Fight is tonight. You're both going to fight, but no, you're not allowed to say, he's not allowed, you're not allowed to say who won and who lost. Would you care if you would lose a fight like that? And they all say no. I say, well, then you're not fighting for yourself. Then you're fighting to please the people. And once you start doing that, you put way too much stress on yourself. You see, you just said it that you don't care because now nobody knows. You see what I mean? So it's yeah. only you know. And you know, from a loss, I never seen a loss. I've never been down from a loss. You see me party as hard as after a win. I don't care because now I knew that. Oh well, I'm going to have to work harder. You know, that's yeah. the message that I'm going to get. I'm not going to. I see these guys going back. No, I'm not going to go out tonight. I'm uh, you know, completely destroyed. I go. I never saw it like that. I always saw it as a plus. You know. Well, it's not a fun thing. But you know, now now I'm going to be forced to train harder. It's learning experience. So yeah. you had uh, Don Clovis in your corner. Yeah, yeah. he was, he was also manager. your manager. Why did you go without a corner? I didn't have a corner. Nobody was teaching me. I, I trained myself. I literally <laughs> my first nine months in Pancras, I was training on the back. I was dropping oh. my students all the time because I was two times a day. 12 rounds on the back. That's the only thing I did. And then once in a while, I would go to uh, uh, Amsterdam to train there. But, you know, sometimes I'm there and then the class is not on or the, the less people people move, went away when I walked in. So I wasn't there a lot. You know, if I had 12 classes in total at the, at the gym in, 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 in uh, Amsterdam, that's about it over my entire career. You see, so I, I training myself. And then after my last loss against Ken, I became very vocal uh, about, I needed somebody to train with. And then I found Leon Van Dyke. And he was a 19 year old kid at the time, freaking great striker, super strong. 
a great athlete and, uh, and he said, oh, I would love to uh, do it with you. And then we just watch tapes and watch fights and watch the structural tapes. And then I would just go and then I said, wait a minute, I can make this better, I think, you know? And we started experimenting and then I fell in love with it. Now suddenly the ground was my number one priority. So I started doing it two or three times a day. I became obsessed. I always tell the story, you know, I would submit my wife in the middle of the night because I would dream a submission and would wake up and I'd put her in that submission <laughs> and then I would write it down. I do it, and this is in the kitchen, okay, you lean over, I would put it in a choke. Are you getting dizzy? If it's hurting, I'm getting dizzy. You see, it's a blood choke. Okay, writing it down again. Dude, but you know, once you become obsessed with something, you love it. And, you, and that's the only thing I miss really a, a, a lot right now because of my neck. I can't roll anymore. But mm. man, that was it. That was my last loss. I actually, after my last loss against Ken, I won my next eight fights by way of submission. One with submission control, the rest all finishes. They were like, wow. what the heck is going on? I just completely invested myself in the ground fighting. At the end of my career, I actually have more submission victories. I think 15 14 and then 12 uh, knockouts. So I have actually more submission victories than I have knockouts now. Yeah, so there, there was a rough road in the beginning. And then you go on, like people, we talk about historic, you know, runs in mixed martial arts. Your 22 fight win streak is in the conversation with, you know, one of the top three greatest runs of all time. But you were still kind of cutting your teeth at this time. And at Pancrase 2, which is three weeks later, October 14th, 1993, you fought Takaku Fuki. Yeah. Who was also very tough. Yeah, yeah. But I fought him, uh, I fought him three times, right? Oh, let me see. Yes. Oh, yeah, I fought him three times. Yeah, yeah. But so what, your first time was not easy. The first time I was sick. Uh, that was my very first fun. Um, I was throwing up Clovis that you were talking about is literally carrying my mask, my, uh, uh, my bags, uh, throwing up. Okay. You have to understand going from Holland to Japan. It is the worst jet lag. If you ever go to Europe from America, that's a jet lag you have if you go from Holland to Japan. So nighttime is daytime. So let's say uh, in the morning, 11 o'clock at night, that's seven in the morning. So all night you're awake. You know, and uh, and I was throwing up. They woke me up at eight o'clock. They let me travel for five freaking hours on the day of the fight. Yeah, why would they do that, right? So crazy. And then I I, I forced them. I said I had to go to the hotel. I want to shower before I do it. They said no, you can't. I said I'm not going to fight. It's either you let me do that or not. I said I'm throwing up. I'm I feel, I'm sick. You know, I want to shower. So I showered and I went to the place. And my gloves is carrying my stuff. And he gets me in an armbar. And I just want to tap. Uh, but then the, the audience start chanting for him. And I go, oh, shit. So, because now my ego took over. Mm -hmm. So I'm dragging him just to the other side. Instead of touching the ropes here, I, I thought it was better to touch it over there. So I just dragged him through the rope. Idiot. I touched a rope, and now there was a rope escape. That was the different th rules that we had in Japan. And then 30 seconds later, I knocked him out with a knee to the liver. And that was the, that was a cool thing also, because I was so in the moment, I, I didn't have a lot of power. I saw him breathe. <sighs> He was breathing in, and on the third breathing in, I need him because I know that once you breathe in and I hit you, that's when you go down. You can do a thousand sit ups a day, it doesn't matter. You breathe in, <laughs> you know, I'll knock you out. You know, anybody does that, can you knock you out at that moment? And uh, that's where I timed the knee. You literally so, and boom, the third knee, I knee him. And when you see the knee, it's not even that crazy hard of a knee. It's a knee to deliver, though. Uh, but if you see him go down, you're like, man, they just shot this guy. But it was just because he was breathing in. I got him at the right moment. So, so, boss, they were bringing you in like the day of the fight back then. I mean, when I started going there, they'd bring you in like six days early. You'd get time to get ready and acclimate. And, man, you can't you can't fight there unless you've had at least three days. I remember first coming there, I, like the second day I went there and started working out. And I was like, oh, my God. I'm tired after two minutes. What's going on? I'm not in shape. I didn't train hard enough. And the third day, I was like, oh, my God. And then the fourth day, I started, okay, my body got used to it. But the first two days, I felt terrible, man. They were bringing you right there to a fight? No, 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 no. So what they did is they had me, I don't know where that fight was, but it was in Osaka or somewhere else. Oh, and okay, okay. At a sleep hotel at, uh, in, in Tokyo. And at okay. 7 in the morning, when I just was asleep, maybe for an hour, I had to go take the, a, a, a taxi, to the, the, the train, the JR train, from the JR train ah. to the gun sand, the freaking fat bullet train that go, dude, it was insane. It was insane. Ah. It was at least five hours because I, at three o'clock I was at the, uh, at the hotel. Okay. Yeah. Mm. 
It's so at this point, <laughs> at this point, Bass is becoming incredibly popular amongst the locals. At the end of his fight, you know, he jumps up, kind of does the splits, puts his hand between his legs, and like the crowd is almost like pro wrestling, going woo, woo, with every single, with every single movement, and you can tell they had a star on their hands. So they line up January nineteenth, nineteen ninety four. Masakatsu Funaki, who's also the uh, Pancras co-founder. Yep. Want to walk us through it? Tell us about it. Yeah. So, um, well, after knocking the first two guys out, they, he was a smart man. He took my ass down immediately. <coughs> and I and he did something on me. And I always say that you guys know what it is. He put a toe hold on me. And then when I do these talks, I look, it's, it's not like they hold your toe. I say I saw somebody break his shin bone. Actually, uh, Nagisaba broke uh, Vernon Tiger. No, was it Vernon Tiger? John Moberg shin yeah. bone. Yeah, with a toe hold. So, uh, and what happened also in the fight? And, and listen, I, I was on the ground. I was nothing at the time. So he would have beaten me anyway. So, but what what I do have to say a little bit in my defense is he was uh, on the ground. I hit him in the face. Hit him in the face because he was in my guard. And suddenly I hit him with my fist and I pulled back. I go shit. I'm sorry. You know, and while I said, I'm sorry, he flips around, gets me in the toe hold, and yeah, that was painful. That was the first loss that I had against him. But uh, Fnuck is a good guy. He's a great guy. It was just, I hit him with my fist, which was an illegal move at that time. So was it Hans Nyman in your corner with Don Clovis? No, no. Well, who was that? It was not, uh, who was that fight? I Clovis was there, but then probably... Um, uh, what's his name again? Utela. Uh, okay. On the Utela, he was he was a boxer from Holland who also had a few matches in Pancras. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I have a question for you now. You've been you 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 took a couple of years off in Holland and you said you kind of got lost kind of in the partying scene and stuff like that. Now you're in Japan and they usually you know you're becoming a star. They start to take care of you. Are you are you still partying like you know hard? Because I know that you're a very intense individual. How, yeah. how is that aspect going in uh, Japan? You well, know, as hard as I train, as hard as I party. You know, like I will be two days completely go crazy. But the great thing in Japan was you have to understand. My first year, I think I fought eight fights. My second year, I fought nine fights. I mean, you're fighting almost every month. You know, because if you're not injured, why not fight? You know, we're making money. I mean, you got two thousand bucks for a fight, you know, you, you need more fights in order to survive from that money. <clears throat> but then once you start winning, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But uh, yeah, the party I always did, I would go crazy, but only for like two days, and I'm back in training again. <laughs> Just two days, Mike. Just two days. So, <laughs> Bass had these like, these purple kind of mauve colored shorts yeah. for his first three fights. And then, like, you became, uh, I don't know, a little more regimented. You changed it to a Speedo with the Dutch flag on the side. Was that for marketing purposes? No, 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 no. They hated that pants. They, they Unaki gave me the outfit. He says, please do not wear that anymore. Please <laughs> wear this. So, yeah, no, that was a present from them. I go, those are my lucky pants, you know. They were used to be dark purple, but because they got washed so many times, they were, like, pink. You know, and they're all hanging down. It was, they got ripped. They were skin. ugly. And they were super they're ugly. And then the shin guards I had were those sock shin guards, you know, those white things that you can buy the cheap <laughs> ones. I go, why would I get thick ones if I can do more damage with these thin little things, you know? So, yeah, so they, they changed everything. They said, no, no, no. Let's, uh, here, you got a new outfit. Okay, good. So yeah. I think this is where a rivalry starts your next fight with the. Uh with Lion's Den. On April 21st, 1994, Pancrase 3, Pan Crash, you fight Vernon Tiger White. Yeah. And Vernon, Vernon it, it seemed like you were in his head before that fight even started. I think I had it with a bunch of guys, only finding out later. <clears throat> when you read their interviews and they go like, yeah, nobody wants to fight boss. They saw this guy. You know, I had no clue they were thinking like that about me. So later on, I get see you go like, okay, maybe, yeah, it was. What really was, what, what weird was with Vernon is that the day before I fly out, I don't want to train as far anymore. <clears throat> so I'm an idiot. I go in the forest and in Holland, you got this crazy path and they go up and down, you know, but there's roots as well. And I, I switch, switch my ankle. I flip my ankle. 
And I'm literally on the ground there for like 20 minutes. I go, do I don't know. I go, well, this is not good, but it's not broke. Okay, that won't be okay. And I got four more, you know, I'm traveling. And I got like five days before the fight because now I wanted to be there sooner. Um, so finally, I get out of the forest. I mean, I get on the flight, but it's hurting. But I pack it in and I don't show anybody. So I'm completely poker face when I walk in with the fights. What's up, everybody? Boom, 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 boom. But in my dressing room, I go, shit, oh, my, uh, in my hotel room. And so I can guarantee you they didn't notice. But it was so wild. Vernon is the first thing he does. He dives to that foot and puts it in a toehold. It was almost like I was sending out a signal with that leg that he said, take me, take me, take me. And immediately he shot for it. Now, thankfully, I got him in a guillotine and that uh, stopped the fight. But it's weird how that works, right? Because you have one injury somewhere on the body and somehow he knows immediately what is wrong with you. Or he maybe subconsciously knows it. I don't know. So, so you got him in a guillotine there, hat. Huh? I mean, was that just kind of observing, like I said, you and Leon kind of figuring that out? Because, I mean, he'd been trained at the Lions that he had been put in a thousand guillotines. You know, it's pretty impressive you were able to get that. How, how would you learn that or just from trial and error? You know, it's the it's the striker submission, right? I mean, yeah. if you strike it, they shoot on you. And the first thing you can grab is the head. So I figured I'm just going to become really good at it. I had a bunch of, I think I have like five guillotine victories because I was just really good with it because it was the only thing I knew, you know, yeah. I knew a little thing here and there, but that one I knew very well. So, uh, yeah, that's probably the reason I just used it over and over again. Okay. <clears throat> so your next bout is a 20 year MMA veteran, uh, from D bone gym, Kazu Takahashi. Takahashi's an animal. Yeah. Oh. Uh, that's a, uh, it, I feel bad about that fight also because he's also, he was like me, a, a party animal. We would hang out together. He's a really cool guy, man. I always liked mm -hmm. Takahashi a lot. He was like, they would call him the, the, the Japanese boss with him. That's how crazy he was <laughs> because I was crazy at the time. Mm -hmm. um, this is how I received my fifth degree black belt actually uh, for that, uh, because of that fight. So what happened was John Blooming, who is the highest Kyokushin foreigner there is next to Masoyama, who started Kyokushin in Japan. He's with me in Japan and we're walking on the street the day before the fight and we hear this, we are hybrid wrestling, bankers. And we were like, what, 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 what? we're looking at a wall, a freaking wall of a building. And there's, it's a, the, the promotion is on there. I don't know how they got it on. I mean, this is 94, right? And just the giant truck, oh, and the first thing we see is me knocking out Yagi Sao, my first fight. So it's a promo for the next day. And we go, oh my God, this is great. And I see somebody sitting in half guard and he grabs the heel, goes for an inverted heel. And he grabs the heel and he falls back. So I said to John Blooming standing behind me, I go, wow, that's a cool move. I got to remember that. That's, that's nice. I, I should try that thing out. So the next day I'm in the fight and I'm in that position. So I figured, oh, I'll try it out. So I grab his heel, but I never did it in training. So I had no clue the amount of pressure that I put on him. So I grabbed the heel, hold it tight, and I just fell backwards. And then we hear, Pack! so I, I let go. And then he stand up and I think his knees blown out, right? That's what normally happens. So and he stands up and the referee says, are you okay? And he goes, yeah, you see the positive look on his face. No, the referee, I'm even looking, I go, I, we heard a snap, you know? Now what happened was, it was not his knee, it was his shin bone that snapped like half in. So now he thinks he's okay and he kicks me with that leg. And I'm just flexing my leg. And you see the leg wrap around it. Ah. It was on the ground. Freaking broke his shin bone in half. You see, that was the moment that I also started thinking, whoa, whoa, whoa. We always thought that submissions was for sissies. That's just everybody thought that, right? It was all the boxers were the toughest, the, you know, the strikers. And that's when I started realizing, whoa, whoa, whoa. Submission guys are way more destructive. They can dislocate any, any joint and it can break pretty much any bone in the body. That's a big power to have. And, and a, a blue belt can already do that. Everybody from blue on can do it. White belts can do it already, but once you become a blue belt, so it's not only me, every single person can do that. That's a big power to have. You know? So that's when it starts dawning in my head. Maybe I should start doing more submissions. <clears throat> so at this point, you're doing really well there. Is, um, is Japan... Is Pancras blowing up? Like, are people coming up to you on the street? Do they have the baseball cards? I mean, are you becoming a like a pretty well-known commodity there? Yeah, yeah, it was really crazy. Uh, I, and all the people too, and you, you fought there as well, Chris. It's like you have guys, uh, like like a seventy-five-year-old people come up to you, and they know your whole uh, your whole career. It's amazing, and they love fighting. 
Uh, and everybody on the street, you have people stopping you, making pictures. Yeah, it's it's big. It's big over there. It's like almost like when you go to Vegas. If they, there's certain towns, when you go there, you know you're going to get stopped like 50 times every day, you know, because everybody who trains fighting there, they know fighting because, you know, that's that's Japan. That's the same thing. You know, I, if I had to pick a fight that haunted Kazu, I think it's this one. I think this fight really bothered him. I think so too, because you know he was such a tough guy, and then I and, and it was bad, man. I mean, I was crying. I, I went to uh, visit him. Eight months he was in the hospital. He he uh, developed an infection with it, and when I walked to their place, he was sharing with other uh, uh, athletes, uh, known athletes from Japan, a room. So there were like six people in one room. I mean, I remember they came to bring him coffee, and the coffee mug they didn't even clean the coffee mug. They just added the coffee. So just a refill from like this morning. And I, mm -hmm. I, 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 tears in my eyes when I had to leave. I felt so bad that this guy was out for such a long time. I think it was like five months in the hospital and then three months for rehab, something like that. Yeah. Miguel Lickerson, he, he got bounced out. <laughs> um, and in, even in his rematch with you, you could see it. Like it, he is a uh, naturally tough guy. And that, that fight truly, it, it haunted him. You, the way, uh, you see, man, this is so crazy. Did I didn't rematch him? I, I don't think I rematched him after that. I, I have it. I have it in my notes. I, oh, that's crazy. I, I have made mistakes in the past, boss. <laughs> uh, our comment yeah. section on YouTube tends to highlight them and enjoy them for <laughs> this. It usually starts with, you know, come on, Mike, by Chris. But I, I believe there was a rematch. But your next fight, Minuro Suzuki. Yeah. Ooh, boss, let me tell you something, man. You looked up until this point, you just said you were very concerned, you were very caring, but prior to that move, moment of concern and caring, you were very calm, relaxed, and I think the damage that you created in that calm, relaxed state, it, it, it was unlike everybody else. Like, it, it, it's pretty scary, like, as an individual to watch. And Suzuki, he put it on you with wrestling. Yeah, he did. <clears throat> and you know what you talk about? It's like, I, I literally, when I watch fights now, old fights, I know that was a different guy. And I'm always good, but I had this crazy switch and it would never be an angry switch, but there would be anger involved, but like a controlled or something. Um, I don't know. It was really weird. Yeah, I would have, doesn't matter who I'm fighting, even if I'm fighting a friend. And I would tell them before, I said, listen, man, once it's on, we're just going to go try to knock each other out, right? And then later on, we drink a beer, cool, and we shake hands. And then and it's just the click goes on, but it's not a crazy click, like ah, the control click. I know exactly what I'm doing, but yeah, it was a I was a different person at that time. Uh, and Suzuki was a great wrestler. I was actually the first guy who gave him his loss. Um, he, He's seven and zero. Oh. Yeah, he was future world champion. Place. Yeah, he was he was really good on the ground. But you know, I set him up there because I needed to get him off the ground, and I knew by now that if I would if somebody sits mount position and I would simply lock my hands. They would always go for an armbar because once they have the tools, they will figure out how to break my grip. But I knew that. So you see me literally doing this, and then Suzuki wants to go for an armbar, but as soon as he does, I'm, I'm pushing his leg off him. Now I'm in his guard, have the better position. And that's, you know, I just baited things. I would put an arm in the middle, like I'm too stupid, you know, like <laughs> in the guard and put an arm in the middle, you know, and I will look away. That was my guard escape. Because they immediately go for an armbar. As soon as they throw the leg over, I just pull my arm out and now I'm a side mount. I mean, how easy is that? Just give them something and they'll take the bait. And that's what I did with Suzuki. And then I, on the stand up, I think I, I, I connected with a knee. And then uh, I think, uh, uh, oh, wait, that's where I gave him a knee. Oh, that's a badass moment. You see yeah. me kneeing him and then you see the camera zoom out and he's literally like a couple of feet away. <laughs> I need him to the, to the air. To the body and that was it he was well, he, on the ground and he, he tries to beat the 10 count yeah and he's holding his stomach i mean it's a lot of courage to stand up from that yeah and then he just collapses again like yeah. it's there was no faking that man like he was i remember watching that fight i didn't watch it live but went back and watched it i remember like i was like oh yeah you're getting dominant then all of a sudden you need him that once in the ribs fight was over i was like man i gotta learn how to do that because you need him <laughs> once that was it that was uh i remember watching that fight you know what i always say to people everybody can do that you know it's it's true but what people are doing with creatures of habits so in the ufc for instance or in any big belt or doesn't matter you see him throw these stupid knees to the body 
That's what you do in training. That doesn't yeah. work in fighting. You know, I just wait, 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 and then explode. I always say I have this bold up energy, which has suddenly let go. That's how it feels. And then I just let it explode my knee. And I try to do it at the right time. And if you do it like that, everybody can do the same. Like knees yep. to the thighs, you know, in the clinch, knees to the thighs. Look at the stupid knees they throw. Yep. I can stop you with one or two knees. That's it. Fight's over. Yep. If you really jump to the side, if you see me doing this on the back, dude, I would work on that. That's one or two knees. Fight's over. There's no way you can stand after that. But if you do this little patty knees, yeah, they're not going to do anything. Maybe nice. Oh, but that's yeah, it. You almost like you cut an angle. Like it's on a clinch, you step to the side and then go in. Yeah. It's almost like if you watch Triple G, you know, you never cross your feet in boxing. But yeah. when you watch Triple G cross his feet, he comes in at a different angle. It's you do that exact same thing with your knees. I you know it's always try best position. Listen, till this day, if I'm shadow boxing, it's all my that's my focus is all on my feet the whole time. But are they on the ground at the moment of impact? Straight punches always from the back foot, two punches, the hooks. Two feet on the ground, like like that's constantly. I'm still doing this after so many years. It will never go away. <laughs> focus, focus, because it's every you never can never master it. They always say you're never good. You at had it. you had Remco Pardue in your corner, I believe. Oh, he was also there one time. Yeah, he fought against Ferdinand, I believe. Ferdinand Tiger White as well. So you're still going without a corner. I'm still going without a corner. He was just fighting there. I did. A, I trained a couple of times <laughs> with Remco. Uh, but that was it, you know, I was never, Leon was my main guy. Leon actually started doing really well. He, well, he, he dropped Evan Tanner with the front kick to the solar plexus, right, at the time. And uh, that, that, that was a big uh, thing. People were like, okay. So he had some devastating knockouts. Also, I always thought that Leon had the worst luck in the world. He would always get just injured like two days before or something. And, but I go, man, it is, I, he fought against Gilbert Ivel, but all, again, he had to cut so much weight and there was something going on. He always passed out almost in the dressing room. He would have destroyed him, man. Leo was an animal. He could hit so hard. His street fights, he had a, we were, he's eating French fries and this guy's in his face. And he's going, and go, bah! And, then, and while the guy goes down, I go, dude, that was cool. And he goes, yeah, all right. And he's just competing. <laughs> I mean, his fists, like people say, you have such a big fist. He shoots his, his fist are like here. He's a, everything, every fight, street fight that I saw him, it's one punch. That's it. One guy, he's there. He's dressed up with carnival. He's in an, um, he, he's a priest. He has a long rope on and he's there with his girlfriend. And these three guys, they start grabbing his girlfriend and, uh, and they start pushing him away. So he wants to kick one guy in the head, but because it's a rope, he falls on the ground. Now they all start laughing at him. And I go, oh shit. That's not good, dude. Do not laugh. And <laughs> destroy these guys. Like, no chance. Like, scary stuff. Yeah, he's an, uh, he's an animal. Man, I remember, I remember, yeah. he, he, I was at that first fight. With, uh, my first fight there, he fought Evan Tanner. Oh, man, this guy, I, I knew who Evan Tanner was, and he beat him with that kick, like you said. And I remember he fought, I think it was a big Yanagazawa, I think, and he hit him open head with a palm strike and laid his eye open. It looked like a goat vagina. It was just this huge cut like that big. I was like, oh my God. He opened with a palm. I never seen anything like it, man. He split that guy open. I was like, I don't want to get hit by it. I do not want to get hit by that guy, man. So, so, so that's what the goat vagina looks like then. I, I, never yeah, I, I guess. I guess. I don't know. It's like, <laughs> it pretty disgusting, man. It's a bad from cut. Indiana. Give him, give him a little play. He's from Indiana. <laughs> Maybe. I'm guessing. I don't know. <laughs> so, so, Bass, at this point, <laughs> I think you're probably the roster's most popular fighter. And it's not something that's planned. No. It's just what happened. And I've never knew. I got to also understand. I, I never had that idea because I saw everybody getting attention. I never knew that. Afterwards, when you start looking back, you go, oh, I was pretty okay. I pretty okay. That's why they actually called me back after all the event, but we're probably going to go to that fight. Uh, when I stepped away from Pankers to go to the UFC, they wanted me back because the, the, it, was, it was going slower. They wanted to reboot. I asked if I wanted to fight one more fight. But uh, I had that time, I had just a fight planned with Randy Couture for the UFC in October. I remember it was that. <clears throat> and they wanted me to fight in September. And, um, and I said, you know, I can't do that because if I get injured, you know. But, you know, we had such a long relationship with each other that I uh, finally I say, you know what, we'll give you somebody uh, who's not that good. And I go, you know, okay, I'll do it. I'll take him down and I'll go for a submission. You know, I'm not going to hit him that because I don't want to hurt my hands. 
<clears throat> now I'm walking. If you ever want to see a fight, uh, how you fight with emotions, watch that fight. But the worst fight I ever had. Because I will explain to you why that is now. So I'm walking on the street to Guy Matzka two days before the fight. And Guy goes suddenly, hey, you know they trained this guy for you for like the last year and a half, right? I said, what do you mean? He says, oh, he's been training since you knocked out Funaki. And he was already training there before. When you knocked out Funaki, he got apparently his vengeance. And he says, I want to fight Boss Root. And they trained this guy over and over again. I said, wait a minute. To me, they said he was a new guy. Now he's a pro, uh, ex-pro uh, rugby player. And who started training a long time ago. I go, so now I'm super angry. Mm. I go, oh, OK. I'm sorry, Hans. You know, we're going <laughs> to knock this guy out, you know? So, and then when you see that fight, I'm so out of control. I knock him out, but it's like, that's the fight I show people. I said, this is what happens when you fight with emotions because it's so sloppy. I'm so all over the place. It was crazy. It was just completely pissed me off. And there was a moment when he's on the ground and I would never hit somebody, although it's legal, but I would never do that. With him though, he fell and I go, bomb, hit him in the face. And I remember the pancreas <clears throat> or Ozaki, the owner came walking to me to the ring and he says, please, Mr. Rutten, uh, relax. I go, no, no, you started the shit. I was so angry. I go, how can you do this, man? I've been fighting for you guys for such a long time. If you would have told me, then I said, okay, at least I can deal with it and don't expect something. But to hear it from another fighter, you know, yeah, that really got me angry. So, <clears throat> so a big rivalry is between you and the Shamrock family. Obviously, right. it's very historic. And on July 26, 1994, the road to the championships three, you meet Ken Shamrock for the first time. Yeah, that was a long time. That was a long fight, actually. I did uh, 16 minutes, 42 seconds. Yes, yeah, see, so that was pretty good at the time. But, you know, I guess <laughs> I was so stupid at the time with the submissions. He's on my back and I'm getting so angry. And I go like, get off of me, you know, and he's back. What do you think he's going to do? I'm like, Flick. I got a real naked choke. Yeah, you live, you learn, right? It's, uh, but, you know, still, I thought hey, it was okay. I, wa I was happy with the result. I knew I needed to work on my ground because I still didn't have any ground. And I still didn't have the people to train with. Leon, I didn't have at the time yet. So that was that happened after Leon came much later and after the second time I lost against Kim. Well, here on this on this fight, you were, I think there was three rope escapes that you used. Oh, how yeah. many, how many were the I thought they only gave you one rope escape? No, no. You have five for a 30 minutes fight. You have three for 15 minutes fight. And when it goes the distance, it's, it counts like an eight count. So you have that, if you had two eight counts, you had a guy three rope escapes, or the guy with two, uh, with the least amount of red cards, whatever you want to call it, is going to win. I actually, till this day, I, I believe they should do another organization like that. You know how many people from Pancras became UFC champions? I was in Saturday, and you know why that is? And I guarantee you this is why. Because Experience. sometimes you fought five fights in one night. Because if I knock you down, boom, you get an eight count. No, fight starts on the feet again. Oh, I get him in a submission. He can't touch the rope. Oh, stop mm -hmm. again. But you see, so if you look at me, I think I have like 43 submissions. But I have 50, <laughs> 15 on my record. But you see, I'm just going over and over again. So you get more ring time. You're constantly in there, back on your feet. Hey, we fight another fight. I truly believe that's one of the reasons all these guys, we were so used to fighting and, you know, we get more methodical because you had more ring time. Yeah, I thought so, too. At one point, you audibly yelled out loud as you were dragging yourself and Ken to the ropes for an additional ring escape. That was not an easy fight. No, that was not an easy fight. It's, uh, it's, it's never good when you fight somebody who knows what he's doing on the ground and you're a little less. You know, like 10% of that. Not fun. Was there a little intimidation on your end prior to that fight? Oh, 100% guarantee. You know, when... when I remember after the last the second time when I fought against Ken, I, I was there one time a month. Oh, that was it. I was there for a month. This was when I beat, I beat somebody who was, I think Suzuki for the title. That was it. And then I fought Ken. I, I have to look it up. But I, I was fighting two fights in one fight, in, in one night. Uh, yes, it was Suzuki. And then I fought later, I fought Ken. <clears throat> and I was training with the, with the, the line dance guys. And I always thought that my level was here and their level was there. And that's when I realized the level is not what I thought it was. It was completely different. I was, I was actually doing really well. And then I go like, oh, wait a minute. See, because I never had any people that had standards. But once I rolled with them, I realized, wait a minute, I'm really not that bad as I thought I was. And that gave me a big boost. Then I said, okay, 
I can hang with these guys. I remember coming home and tell my wife, I said, I can think, and now I believe I can be the world champion of this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's mental. Now, and, let, let, let me ask you, you're in 94 now. Where, where were you for the UFC in November of 93, the first UFC? How did that impact you? Oh, it, it was insanity to me, you know. They, uh, Ken was t- talking about it on because I fought in September 93, and he was fighting the November show. He was talking mm-hmm. about it in the dressing room with me, and he said, man, it's so crazy. There's no referee. And, again, and I, would you, would you want to do that? I go, no referee. I go, no, I wouldn't like to do that. He says, why not? I said, because I don't like to get knocked out and then get hit 10 more times in the face if there's mm-hmm. no referee to stop these people. You know, there's some crazy people out there. And then when you saw the first UFC, well, Welcome to the club, Gerard Godot from Holland. Boom! <laughs> He's flying into the front. I mean, I was like, this is crazy. So they always ask me, you want to fight? I say, if they have the referee, I would love to fight. And then Big John puts his foot down on the third UFC, I believe. And he says, it's either I'm going to have to step in or I'm going to quit my job, he said. Yeah. And they needed him. And, and that's why they kept him. And thankfully, and that's the moment I said, okay, now I would love to fight in the UFC. In, in terms of overall savagery of events like total carnage i have to assume there was probably about 10 ambulances used for ufc too there is no event more violent than that one especially with people that aren't really trained to do the sport that they're participating in that was it i mean there's people who had no business being there you remember the pressure <laughs> point guy who was going to pressure point too and he got yeah. so destroyed. You know, or no what about... chance. we all thought these guys were so great. Yeah. Hey, what, what, what's your opinion of uh, there was a Dutch guy in there who did a sure vicious, the brutal knockout? Well, hold on. I'm talking about number two. And then I almost killed it was Orlando V. Yeah. Do you know him? Give me a story of Orlando V. There, there, were, there was two guys, two from both from Holland, right? Uh, yeah. And, 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 yeah. Yeah. and uh, Orlando V. Oh, um, one of my favorite strikers of all time. Him and, oh my God. Oh, he had legendary fights. I forget his name. I got a blank on it right now. He had legendary, I think they fought like four times. In, in Holland, there was this other black guy who was an incredible fighter. And both these guys, if they would fight the main event, the, the place would be packed out because they would fight always with elbows. They were just both insane. And uh, yeah, I always loved that guy. But again, you know, striker. They had no ground experience. So he got taken down and then suddenly... Ram goes in the scar fault and he grabs his arm and then he just starts elbowing him in the face. <laughs> yeah, he knocked him out. Uh, and it was a way big weight difference as well. I think Orlando Wood was like 170. Yeah. <laughs> Remco like 245 at least, I think. Well, here, we open up the door to Holland. Uh, Freak Hamaker competed at UFC 2. He was uh, he was replaced by Fred Edish. He was also one of those famous red light district workers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how... How tough was the red light district at this time, to, uh, especially to work in it? Oh, it was, it, it was pretty tough, but it, not as tough as people think, because in Holland, it's always been legal, right? So they have every week tests, and they got blood tests, and they got everything. So it's it's a job there. Like uh, a friend of mine, Joop, uh, Joop from the Van, he was on the second or third fight in Pankers. He fought with us as well. He was also, dude, this is a funny story. So... My wife and I, we meet each other in 92. We go, and we've never been to Amsterdam. So I'm starting fighting in Japan. And then one, there's a time that I, one month don't fight. I say, you know what? Let's go to Amsterdam and have a good time over there. It's been a long time that I've been there. So I'm walking on the red light district. We're checking things out. And this girl start knocking on the window. Boss! Oh! <laughs> oh. <laughs> I tried to explain that. I go, I swear to God. And, and it was for real. I go, I, I haven't been here for five years. Well, how is this even possible? Well, what happened was, the pimp, which is again, it's a legal shop. That was Joke from the Vent. With him, I fought in Japan. So after the first fight, you get all the magazines with all the pictures. They had these great magazines. You remember, Chris? Oh, you know, yeah. Like six, eight pages of you are dude. And they have every picture possible because they will go, brrr, you know, so really badass magazines. And he told these girls, he says, Oh, this is my friend Boss. He's also fighting and he's going really well. He's doing really well. So these girls recognize me from the picture, but you know, yeah. that was the wrong moment. <laughs> walking yeah. with you. No. Uh, man, so, I, I used to love getting those magazines, man, because I couldn't read a lick of Japanese, but I assume they were saying good things. But you know, there was no social media then. So I just, you know, you wait for them to send you your videotape in your magazines, and I'm like, yeah, yeah they'd have it all. 
put like the little things the tape showing you what page it was on. I, I, I loved it, man. It was it was treated like a real sport there, and it wasn't here. So I, I loved going over to Japan. And, and see what he said, right? Videotape, remember? <laughs> yeah, the, the VHS was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so class, we we do a couple of the we do two a week, and we run into on the local independent promotions a lot of I don't know, like biker gangs or sometimes people involved in nefarious activities which support the regional local mixed martial arts scene. And the Bulldog Hash Shop was one of the first places on the Red Light District. Hank Devrias yeah. was the owner. Was he heavily involved? in the mixed martial arts scene in the early days? They all love mixed martial arts, yeah. They all, all, all these guys. And, and those are not, uh, those are the good guys, you know, once they have a legal business like that, yeah. But it's more of the underworld also. They're involved with it. And those are the guys who get, you know, when the fight's on and uh, every time something breaks out. You have no idea. If there's a fight in Holland, you could have like five zero fifty, 50, like undercover cops there at least you know, to try to control everything because there's some crazy people out there. You say the wrong thing, boom, it's on. They all sit at the table with the champagne. It's like crazy. Just stand up, walk away when it starts because you never know, guns get pulled, whatever happens. You know, but those those guys, they give, in Holland, mixed martial arts a bad name because like in soccer, every week there's fights and referees get beat up and, and everybody, but that's okay because it's, you know, it's a big money maker. But if it happens at an MMA event or a kickboxing event, oh, it's front page news. You know, it's everywhere. You see kickboxing and you have a fight again. It's like, dude, you're having like 50 of them each weekend in soccer. So, but that's that's just the way the people are. That's It's a shame. It's a shame for all these guys, like uh, Roman Deckers, like the greatest Thai boxer in my book ever lived, Peter Arts, and Ernesto Hoost. I mean, you can read uh, El Gugli, uh, Milo El Gugli. I mean, there's a, there's a group of people there are such great strikers in Holland, the mixed martial arts here, uh, Giga Musashi, you know, all, all these guys, Melvin Manuf. I mean, people should know these people, right? Now, um, it's starting very slow though because Rico Verhoeven, he's doing really well. He's a very clean cut guy, good looking guy. And he's Huge. fighting and he gets in a lot of uh, movies and stuff doing that. So he's switching slowly, but surely people say, hey, they're really nice people. And when you see Peter Hans as well, but these guys should have been famous. I mean, they fought the best people in the world and destroyed them, you know, and, and in Holland, nobody really knows. Them. Yeah, they were like movie star looks too. Movie star looks and attitude. Yeah. And let's look on like the administrative side. Golden Glory founder, Rod, Ron Nyquist. Did you yeah. have a good relationship with him? Yeah, we're very close friends. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah, do you remember what, do you remember where you were at when you heard that a car bomb almost killed him? I know 100% because I think he's alive because of me because of that. Uh, because he was calling me before. He was not driving yet. A, 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 a cab dropping him off at his car. And I said, where's your car? And he goes, at the gym. I said, don't drive. I said, stupid to drive. I can hear you've been drinking. I don't want you to drive. I mean, your house is freaking a, a, a mile and a half away. Drive to the house. Get to pick up the car tomorrow. He says, okay, sure, sure, sure. And he hangs up the phone. He still goes to the car. Now he sits in the car, he wants to start the car, but then he looks at his wife and he says, you haven't been drinking? Yeah. Oh, why don't you drive? So she walks around and while she walks around, he climbs over the, in, in the middle and he starts the car and the car explodes. It's a bomb, but because the doors were open, there was no pressure in the car. I mean, the, 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 the hood was on the roof, a three-story roof that was on top of that. That's all the whole freaking car out. He had a broken ankle or something. That was it. You know, and his wife had nothing because she was outside. So that was the perfect thing. But that's literally, I told him, I said, don't drive here. Because they always say the, the accidents when you're drunk, it's always, it's always close to home. I said, those are the statistics, man. Like, I mean, on 85%. So don't play the statistics. Just, you know, take your cab home. Who cares? So thankfully, he was thinking. And the, the doors were open. Wow. Wow. Yeah. wow. And um, did you know the, the brothers, Rob and Eric uh, Dreisen? Yeah. So they were the ones that were believed to have done that. Yeah. And then when he found out, yeah. You have to understand now also, you know, this is like when you get, he has been had that they would shoot with a machine gun through his window. They did it to the car one time. The bullets went through the baby seat. You know, there, there was no baby in there, but I mean, it, it, it will leave a mark for you. And then, you know, you got this bomb thing. This is like the fourth one because 
Apparently, I did, listen, this is what I hear, right? So uh, the truth will never know the 100% truth. But Ron was doing also illegal business and he, he wanted to go legit. So he was investing a lot in, 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 in uh, real estate. And, and they were the guys who did that through him. So they probably thought that's the story. They thought, hey, wait a minute, because everything is in their name. If he's gone, well, we own everything. So that was the story. And, and so when after the third attempt on his life, you know, he's there and, and he, well, this is what he told me. And again, you know, you don't need, I don't know if it's hundred percent true, but he, he said, he walked around, he says, I got to go to the restroom. They told him they were going to bring him to a special location where he was going to be protected after the car bomb. And he thought there was something going on already. He acted like he went to the restroom. So he goes around the corner, but he stopped. He didn't go to the restroom. And then he heard the other brother saying, shut up, let me handle it. We bring him to this house and we'll take care of the problem right over there. And when he heard, he came walking back and he shot him right away that, you know, that's because he was just at the end of his motion. So that's what happened. That's what I heard from him. But again, you know, this is hearsay. So he didn't ever know. Yeah. And, you know, that early Dutch scene, it was so crazy. Like, do you, do you remember the manager, Epi Etcheld? Yeah, yeah. Epi, Epi Etcheld. Yeah. I did a bunch of shows for him. Those crazy shows that I was talking about with the somersaults and all that. I did a bunch. He was the, he would, he would uh, organize those shows a lot. Yeah. He also went a little dark, right? <laughs> he went a little dark, but he also gave a statement, a very public statement, saying that Simon Rutz had hired a hitman to kill him. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, these guys, they, all these guys, you know, this, that's why I was never in that scene. That people always go like, oh, you, you were shooting people. I say, I was never in that scene. I didn't want to be a criminal. I don't like to get locked up. I really enjoy my life. I don't like to be in a prison. And there's a, there's a little bit not, no, thank you. I'm not going to do it. So I know I never been a criminal. I didn't want to. Be. Sure, we did some crazy stuff, and still some bad things, but not not to the extent what they did. Hey, I I got a question then for you. Like like you said, some of these guys went over to Japan. There's a lot of fun that went on in Japan. Now I heard a story. I think it was one of those. I think it was one of those Dutch guys that was jumping up and down on the roof of a car and actually flattened the car out, like uh, in Japan on a, on some fans. Did you? Take part in that? Were you? I no, I heard that story. And now if, if, if this is the same story, then when the owner came, he wanted to make pictures with the guy who did it. I don't remember what guy. <laughs> because apparently it was it was a cool thing that happened to his car. I go, yeah, but I heard that story. You see that stuff? I'm not into that, man. Like, uh, because once you start t touching people's properties or breaking it, yeah, no. I'd be crazy. I'll be jumping around, but that's it. Yeah, must have been a, a wild night in Rapungi or something. Sounds like I don't know. Hundred percent, you know, it's hundred percent there. L listen, there, there's been some guys who've been crazy and against the wrong people, and suddenly you get a bus, a little van opens up, and uh, six little yakuza guy come out with uh, freaking machine guns and they surround you. Yeah, you're gonna be very small, you know. And I <laughs> guys who had that happen to them, and they were like, okay, okay, that's a different world. Don't go there. <laughs> what what the were you see on the street also? All the drugs, everything. That's not the Yakuza. That's all foreigners. It's yeah. all other people. All the fighting, the all shit that happens in Japan, it's foreigners. It's never yeah. the Japanese. Very yeah, true. Let, let me ask you a question. From around this time, you have Gerard Gordeau, who had the famous fight against uh, Yuki Nakai. Yeah. Now, Nakai is uh, is. A, a legend in shooto and things like that and those were ugly ugly eye pokes like what's your theory why did he even get out of the car why did those little yakuza guys show up for him that day was, was gerard gordo that scary because that was a brutal example of cheating uh 100 but that that's gerard you know he's just in a different thing he's really listen he's the nicest guy ever but he has a switch and if the switch hits then on the street, everywhere, the leg, legendary stories about this guy. You know, very funny guy, good guy. But if he something gets in his head, he's going to simply do it. You know what? what you want to hear something more messed up. So he did that uh, to the guy, blinded him on one eye. So the guy's career is over. Now the guy started working for the company. You know what his job was? Picking up Gerard Dodo from the airport. <laughs> oh, wow. Think about that. I Thanks don't think I'd that. get in that car. I wouldn't get yeah. in that car if I'm charged. Unbelievable, right? I go, this is no way. Yeah, they told me that. I go, that's okay, that's next level yeah, stuff. Crazy. Then you would drive somewhere else. 
right? Yeah. <laughs> Park it somewhere. Yeah. But you need some friends. Well, first of all, I don't want a guy with one eye driving me anywhere. That's is that wrong? No, maybe that was the reason. <laughs> Smart thinking, Chris. So, Dirty Bob Schreiber, one of the rumors that we had heard is that he has no called, like he's no showed actual fights that he was supposed to be in due to the fact that he got in street fights on the way to the venue and he would get locked up. Yeah. Is is that really like uh, is, is that a real part of his reputation? <laughs> Oh, yeah. You know, these guys are, listen, all these guys, they're the nicest guys ever, but they got the shortest trigger. You know, mm -hmm. everything is a challenge to them. You know, you say something wrong to you, say, what did you say? And then if you're stupid, you say one again, they'll, you know, and I'm saying about people on the street. I've seen people like putting a glass of beer, drinking it, and a drunk guy puts it on the car of a buddy of mine. And I, go, I don't want to fight my buddy. He's a crazy guy. And my buddy goes, hey, excuse me, could you please take the glass off? You know, it's a very nice guy. Uh, and he goes, yeah, whatever, man. And all the whole group goes, oh, shit, here we go. You know, yeah. And then it's no stopping anymore. That's it. You just, you're going to get really beat up right now. And those those are the guys. You know, guys like that, they just have very sh short trigger. Super nice guys. Just don't, don't make them angry. The, the thing about Dirty Bob is he he commits, like, like, for instance, he'll go to a neutral corner and then he'll be like, okay, I'm cool. I'm just waiting for things to hash out you will see him just like almost like cartoonish yeah. but like look strange and he'll run across while the referee's tending to him and then like kick the guy yeah like he'll punch the guy right around the referee and then apologize for it like immediately afterward good we, we needed to see him on jerry springer that would have been great <laughs> <laughs> it, it's the strangest it's the strangest thing ever it's all right like, so yeah. I, I, october 15th 1994 uh, mm -hmm. Road to the Championships 5. You got Jason DeLuca, Chris's yeah. favorite fighter. DeLucia. DeLucia. DeLucia my sorry. First guy. Was the first time I fought him? It is. Okay. So I think that was a guillotine choke, I believe. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, yeah, Jason and I always been, I don't know. It was something, I don't know. It was a really nice guy, but something was always triggering me. He did, uh, I at the time, I uh, remember I had eczema or something. And he said, hey, what is this? And he, he touched one of those spots. And I said, oh, it's eczema. And he was oh, like, like, so <laughs> it was me like, like he's, you know, and it kind of, you know, it's kind of weird for people to do like that. Don't even try to hide it, whatever, dude, <laughs> you know? That's why. He was a weirdo. Yeah, he's strange. I, I heard some crazy stories, but I'm not even going to end that because, you know, I, I do like him. Um, in my third fight, I want to skip to that fight because with him, this is very funny. This is the moment when he starts saying that every time I hit him in the throat, which I hit him on the chest, you know, and then he says I kicked him in the balls and it wasn't. And it's like, and I'm getting more and more and more angry. Now it's like, okay, now you got to go. And so there was this game plan that I had. I was going to wait till they said 10 minutes. I'm going to mess around for 10 minutes 10 minutes. And once they say 10 minutes passed, there was those were assignments that I would give myself. I did that with Fanaki also, you know, and 10 minutes passed and then see how fast I can knock him out, you know, so like that. But I <laughs> this first thing in the fight, he makes a back fist and I, and I get so poof, I get hit, right? And you see me doing this and I see blood on my hand. And I think 10 seconds later is where I drop him because I cannot take the race. This is, I don't know how big the cut is. So I drop him. But I was, I was angry because constantly he starts saying these things that I don't truly believe didn't happen. So I hit him with a body shot. He goes down with the liver shot. Then I go back, hit him another way with the liver shot. And then the last one was like, I hit him. And it, you know, when you feel that you missed, but that's because he was breathing in. He was not flexing. Like I slipped through his whole body. That's why I snapped his liver also. He, he had to go for the yeah, I broke his liver. He was peeing blood. But he's on the ground. Now I have the cut. And I see him on the ground. And for the audience, I want to be the nice guy. So I walk over and shake his head. To and so Bob, but this goes in slow motion. It's the funniest thing ever. I said, hey, man, how are you doing? And I'm above him. And he's on the ground again, <laughs> like that. And I see a drop of blood in slow motion going straight into his mouth. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> he's like trying to spit it out. It was the funniest thing ever. But you, you see it literally go, you see it go in slow motion, right in the middle of his mouth. It was so funny. Funniest thing so, ever. We, awesome. we, We've had Gary Myers on, um, <laughs> and he said that Delucia, Delucia, I don't know why I'm struggling with that name. Jason Delucia. and Yuki Kondo were very good friends, 
And Jason would go and just mine information from all of the foreign fighters and then run back to Yuki Kondo and give him the information for the Japanese. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, he said, he said he spoke Japanese and lived over there, too, at times. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was a whole bunch of stuff there going on. I heard a bunch of stories as well. But, you know, that's all the way in the past. And, you know, it, I always respect guys who always – it was in the first UFC – one of the first UFC, I think four or five or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the time, nobody knew what to do. So you got to give them a, at least an, uh, a tip of the head for that. And what's people doing outside, as long as they can kill people, <laughs> I'm all good with it. But yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> So on December 16th, 1994, the King of Pink race opening round. Pass. This doesn't sit well with me. Yeah, they give you Frank Shamrock. Yeah. And it's Frank Shamrock's MMA debut, yeah. which is very difficult. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very difficult fight on his end. Yeah, because I had no ground experience. You know, he simply took me down right away. So that do, you was think, do you think you won the fight? I think it, uh, I believe that, yeah, that I won. But, and, uh, and I thought they were going to do it the second time we were fighting as well, <clears throat> because I have been two instances in a full knee bar, and the referee says break. And I go, I got a full, full on bar. And there's no way escape. Toe is next to me, go, everything is full on. And then they, they broke me up twice. And I go, oh, they're going to do it again. But then they gave me the victory. But then also, yeah, I thought I won. But hey, this one it is. Again, have to start working on my ground, you know. At the end of it, you went and talked to the judges. Like, I think you were asking kindly to see their, their scorecards. Oh, yeah. I don't know anymore at the time. You know, it's like... A, I probably did. That was very, you know, a loss is a loss, you know, and if you believe that you won the fight, yeah, you want to see what actually happened. I've never been in that. If somebody takes you down and doesn't do anything with it, I, I see that as that should count against him. You know, if it's like uh, if I'm a striker and I finally I get somebody on his feet and then I don't strike, I don't do anything. Well, that, that makes no sense. If you take me down, you do that for a reason. You probably the reason is because you don't want to stand with me. But then if you take me down, you go for submissions or you hit me, whatever, perfect. But if you lay there and don't do anything, and I'm not saying he did that, but I, I, I just always think about if people stall and don't do anything with the takedown, why would they count a takedown? That's what I'm doing. So You know, boss, I remember when I would go to Japan and a couple of times I, I lost a couple of close decisions. And I remember at first I thought, I was like, man, you know, they're just not liking me because I'm foreign. I'm not Japanese. They don't like me. And then, uh, and, and I don't know what it was, but then at some point I started thinking maybe what they're really looking for is a little different than what I'm doing. I don't really understand the rule set 100%. Yeah. I thought I started looking at it like that, like, okay, they're doing this and maybe they're giving him more points and I think they should be for that. But that was my ignorance, not understanding the rules. And they really never explained to me 100% what they're looking for. So maybe that was part of it too. We don't really understand. Maybe they're looking for something different. Maybe they just want control. I thought it was more submission based, but maybe it wasn't. I don't know. Yeah, you know, thankfully, it's like uh, I get only I get 28 wins and only three decisions. So I, I just try <laughs> to take him out there because I saw all the other guys. Yeah. You think you win and then you lose. And you go, ah, I'm going to try to take him out, you know, because then at least there's no. I mean, I, I, I remember, like I said, I, I tried to win one decision ever when I lost that. It's like, I'll never try and get it again. It might happen, but I'm not going to try and get a decision yeah. Um, and once you do that, you know, hey, it is what it is. You decide. I don't like it when people go to try and get a decision. If you try and fight to win the decision, you're not my kind of fighter. I want everybody going for finishes. If you do that, I'm going to like you. And if you don't, I'm probably not. So yep. no. I, I, I agree with that. Yeah, I'm 100% on your side. On your side with that. This is quite an upset with Frank. Yeah. I, I don't know. Like, I watched that fight. It didn't sit well with me. I know you gave up the mount a few times. You also had a rope escape, you know, but. I don't know. I, I never started. What on the I, I, I got a question for you. So, so in your opinion, who's better, Frank or Ken? Uh, Frank, and later on, you said that, listen, Frank should be in the UFC Hall of Fame. He's a five freaking time UFC champion. Think about this. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, he deserves that. It's, I think they should bury the hatchet, you know, that the problems that they have, and, and you know, be professional and just get him into the UFC. So like Marco Huas, I would love to see him as well. You know, so, uh, but that's up to them. But he, he, he was the first guy also <clears throat> who started, who get Murray Smith on board to teach him striking. And then, you know, and his stamina started increasing. I was cross-training all the way back. 
I almost never got tired because I knew right away, it's not only today if you do only striking and tomorrow you do only wrestling and then the day later you do only submissions, you, it, it's, that's not going to make you tired. What makes you tired is the combination of all three. And once you start training like that and you do everything, if I would do power training, I would do like five, zero seconds, 50 seconds, 10 seconds to go to the next machine. And then, so uh, one minute, one minute, and then one minute uh, conditioning. And then one, and I had 12 exercises that, but every time it's power, power, conditioning, power, power, conditioning. So mixing it up with power training, biceps, bar, and then now you go in kicking and then you go back and you go with punches and you go back in sprawls, like uh, one minute sprawls. You see, combining the whole thing, that was the trick. And thankfully I figured that out soon. So plus losing a fight in Holland because of stamina, <clears throat> It's not a fun feeling, you know. Uh, fatigue makes cowards out of men. It really is like that. You know, you're really going to feel, if he notices that you're getting tired, you know, it's not a fun feeling. If you don't have anything in the gas tank and he realizes it and they come, <laughs> you know, it's not a fun place to be. So I vowed to never let that happen again. You know, and that was after my second fight already when I almost lost, when I dropped him with the knee. Since then I said, from now on, I'm going to only 100% focus on everything. It doesn't matter who it is. If he's the, the thousandth fighter in, in the, on the list, I still go to prepare like I'm finding the number one guy. Before that, sometimes I, I slacked a little bit. Wow. So in 1990, Manabu Yamada had his first MMA fight. I mean, this guy is just as old school as a guest gets, and you fight him January 26, 1995, <clears throat> at Eyes of the Beast. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, that was a cool thing. I, I, I just figured out the side joke and then the way to, to, to get him into the side joke. Um, and, and I just, I had, listen, I was doing 9 1 on pull ups at the time. I was just freaky strong, you know, and I get him in the a, in a, in a side joke and I'm uh, in my corner. I get Larry, I believe, and Todd Bjornaton were in my corner. They were just fighters who were there and I asked them to be in the corner because they knew what to, to tell me because otherwise I had nobody. And I, I remember hearing Larry go like, squeeze, squeeze. So I'm squeezing everything I got. I mean, the sap comes out almost. And I hear, eh, I hear that sound and I'm looking, I say, are you okay? You see me holding, I say, are you okay? And then I look at him and his eyes are open and his mouth is open and you can't see it on the camera, but trust me, when I was there, there's bubbles of blood. And because he, and I this sound is go, and his bubbles come, blood coming out. And I'm freaking out, dude. I killed the guy. You know, he goes, <laughs> he go, oh shit, shit, what's going on? But thankfully, you know, uh, he, he was okay. But uh, yeah, that was a freaky moment for a moment. Wow. <laughs> it was, I mean, it, I mean, in this relative new age of mixed martial arts, he was 14, six and two at the time. Like that, you and, know, in 1995, and, 1995, that's unheard of. Yeah, but also what you need to know is that he uh, he fought his fight before was a thirty minute fight with Ken Shamrock and Ken couldn't finish him. You see, yeah. so he Ken couldn't put one submission on him. So once I had him, I couldn't believe it. So I just gave it everything I had. What I didn't know was that he was already out after five seconds, but the referee doesn't realize it. And I'm going, keep going, keep going. So yeah, yeah, I think you you, you caught that too. You even like pointed at him, like you I know, think, oh, yeah. <clears throat> So, Bas, you're kind of on a run, and you're making some adjustments. You're showing submissions, but you're still learning. Like, that obsession, I don't think, has kicked in yet because you've got a, a title fight with, uh, with Ken Shamrock at Eyes of the Beast 2, March 10, 1995. Yeah, That's a hard one to watch. You know what? This is my conspiracy theory. Uh, but, I, like I said, it's my conspiracy theory. So... <laughs> I don't know if it's true. I was training with Funaki for one month because I had two fights in one month. And he took it over to help me. And I said, I'm not worried about arm bars or the chokes anymore. You need to teach me how to stop a, a knee bar because I know Ken is really good with that. So he said that he, uh, if somebody's in half guard and they have your leg, he's going to slip his uh, knee over here, over your hip, and then he goes for a knee bar. Well, I don't know anything about submissions. He should have, what I tell my students is, well, if you make sure that he can't pull his legs over to the other side, he can never knee bar you. That's the only thing he should have said, but he didn't say that. He said, he's gonna slide his knee over your hip and he's gonna go for knee bar. 
So I'm going to go for three and a half weeks, stopping knee bar, stopping knee bar, stopping knee bar, stopping knee bar. He's, he takes me down immediately in that position. I, you'll see my head's here. I'm just blocking. And then he throws the leg over my head. Oh, so there was another way to do it. And then you're going to start, th then you start thinking, wait a minute, they go back since pro wrestling, those two guys. They were friends seven, eight years ago. You see, that starts going in your head. Am I right? I don't know. But it was weird that they taught me one, more, uh, one move to stop it while there is also a different way to apply it. I didn't know. I just listened to the master, so to say. So if he should have told me, just hold his leg, because if he can bring it over to the other side, there's no way he can do an e-bar. Solved. Problem was solved. But he didn't say that. So that's in my head. You would get at this moment, you had no problems giving up the mount. Like it was just no big deal for you to, to put yourself in, in that position. Yeah. No, it, it wasn't. I always, it's too much, you know. And it was also, you understand, they, they weren't hitting. <laughs> One time, I think it was, uh, what did it? If they would hit me, they knew I would start hitting back on the ground. You know, that was kind of a gentleman rule. So, I, I mean, if you're a mount sitting high mount on your chest and they start hitting me, yeah, that's a different story. Then I'm going to have to escape. But otherwise, eh, what are you going to do? There's not a lot of submissions you can do for mount, right? And I can bait you out easy. You know, again, I will do this. Hopefully, you're going to go for an armor because then I will escape at the moment you're going for an armor. Stuff like that. So, yeah, I never paid really attention to that. So, you're two and three in your last five fights. <clears throat> Where's your head at at this point? Oh, that's when I started rolling with the guys. <clears throat> that was the, the, because it was the second fight that I got fought against Ken. That's when I was training with the other guys. And I realized I'm better than I am. And although I lost the fight, now I find a training partner, like a real good training partner. Uh, I think that I found Leo maybe a little bit before that, uh, maybe a couple of months before that. And then we started training. But that, we, we always did striking. It's so funny how this goes. And, I, and I'm, I'm shouting at people. Uh, who doing it nowadays, I go, I don't understand it, but I used to do that myself as well. You never work on your weaknesses. It's really weird. <laughs> you, you enjoy it to beat people up with your striking in class. Why would you go to the ground and make it difficult on yourself? And once I made that last loss against Ken, that was the only thing I'm doing. I'm laying on my back. You can take any position over me, what you want. And I'm going to try to reverse your go for a submission. When, when I got you in the submission, I'm laying on my back. You can take any position you want. I always put myself in the worst case scenario. And once I started doing that, that's when my whole life changed. That's when my groundwork started coming. And then I didn't care anymore people taking me down because, like I said, I never took anybody down. But still, I have 15 or 14 submission victories. So I did something right, you know. Boss, that's, I was, what, I was, that's what I always tell, like, new or good guys ask me for advice. I'm like, man, work on your weaknesses. I mean, the, the, a lot of really good guys I've seen who are great kickboxers, whenever they train, like, let's kickbox. Yeah, you're good at it. It's hard to humble yourself to go get beat on the ground, but you have to do that because the sport's too good now. You can't you can't focus on your your, your strength. you got to focus on the weak. You can't have weaknesses anymore. That's old. Those days are over, man. Remember back in the 90s, he's a kickboxer. He's a wrestler. That's over, man. You can't do that anymore. No, completely, 100% true. So, and it, it is so, it, But it's so logic. You know, but yeah. in your mind, you don't do it. And I go, I see fighters now. But you look at them and the loss is all by submission. You go, seriously? You, I mean, I'm a sore loser. It took me three losses by submission <laughs> to say, okay, no more. You know, because otherwise, yeah, I might get lucky and get a champ, become a champ, but then it take it away from me the next time by submission. Why would I? It's, it's part of the sport, you know? So why not learn the game? And once you do, I'm telling you, man, a world opens up. The connections, the possibilities... I, I miss working out, uh, uh, rolling so much because there's it, every every workout you go like you, you discover something new. You know, yeah, that's cool. It's really cool. Man, I, I hate it now. I'll, I'll learn something now, and I'm like, dude, why? Well, I could have used that 15 years ago when I was fighting. <laughs> 15 yeah. years ago, like I can't use this now. I can I can show it to somebody else, and I, and I do that all the time. I'm like, I wish I'd known this, but this works really well if you do this. Yeah. It is amazing how you just keep doing it and then eventually you figure new stuff out. But uh, yeah, that's just the way it goes, I guess. That's it. You know, I wish. There's a lot of things that I do with striking now that I go, oof, I wish I would have known that. Like a clothesline. Yeah. I do a clothesline and it's not the clothesline they do it in, 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 uh, in pro wrestling. Pro. You do my clothesline, it's harder than your high kick. I mean, I let somebody, I say, kick the back as hard as you can. And they kick the back and I do a clothesline on the back. And then you see the back fold around my arm. You cannot defend it. You can wow. do this, it will loop around the neck and it has to still hit you in the back of the head, which is completely legal because it's outside yeah. the Mohawk, but it loops all the way around. 
you know, and I'm hitting with this part of the bone, uh, this part of the forearm. So watch yeah. out, you don't hyperextend, but this over the defense, and it, not even over the defense, but she just loops around. And the power, dude, it's so scary. If you see somebody hold a shield for me and I give that close, line, I mean, you send them flying. It's so Man. much. Once they start throwing those things in MMA, it's going to be fun. <clears throat> Hard to block. Like you said, you can't, no matter what you do, it's going to hit somewhere, man. Yep. Hundred percent, and the power, the sheer power, is hard. Now, let me ask you. So, in Japan now, obviously you're a big star. You're at the top of Pancras, but Pancras never really paid that much. How much? How are other offers? Like, were you ever offered pro wrestling? Did Inoki ever approach you for any of his things? I mean, <clears throat> I no, I was making good money. Like, okay. I, my my last year, I was making. <clears throat> Well, what I said was this. I said, I do four fights for $120,000. So $30,000 a fight. Uh, what at the time was, was, a, it was a good number. Mm -hmm. But I said this, you got, that was the best year I've ever had in my life almost. I said, I want you to start paying me whenever the contract starts every month, $10,000 for $120,000. So 10 times in a row. If I break my leg on the first day, you're going to still have to pay me throughout the whole year, every month, $10,000. And since I was getting really good and now I was holding... You know, I was holding the cards and they had to say yes. And I got to tell you, that's one of the best decisions I ever made. I had no stress about money, no stress about getting, getting injured. Of course, I was making sure I was not going to get injured. Well, one time the fight didn't work out because uh, I was going to fight Guy Metzger and he had a car accident, so we couldn't fight him. So now I had $120,000 for three fights. So now it's $40,000 a fight, you see? And at that time, the UFC, that was in one night, 60000 but you had to fight three fights. So... I wasn't doing that bad. My last okay. fight at 55, I believe. Okay, good, yeah. good. But still, no <laughs> other offers from people no. like... <clears throat> no, I never had offers. No. At the time, there were offers also with rings, but but there was a lot of works in rings. And and yeah. uh, and, 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 and it, it pissed me off all the time and people would say, oh, but, oh, he probably lost, or he probably won, because that's the thing that I never wanted. I said, if they're going to ask me, I'm out. Because there's no way going to ask me. And I remember after the third fight when I fought Funaki, Funaki asked me to go to dinner with Suzuki. And that's when I thought, oh, shit, they're going to ask me. And the whole evening was too good. He gave me a book from Fujiwara, a wrestling book, which I told him is the dumbest thing you can ever do because there's a lot of submissions in there. I'm going to put it on you, right? So we're mm -hmm. laughing and we go, we're leaving. And I'm in the car and they're waving me out. And I'm driving and I stop the car. I say, stop the car. And I open it. I say, can I speak to you? I say, you're not going to ask me a question. He goes, what would, you, what would I need to ask you? I said, you're not going to ask me to win or to lose. And he says, who told you that? I said, some people told me. And he says, I will never ask you to win or to lose. I go, okay, very happy. Because that would be a deal breaker for me. Like, if I lose, I'd rather lose for real than becoming a fake champion. Not for real. You see what I mean? So, yeah. So, but, hey, you know, you look back on the career, you look some fights, they look very fluid between Japanese guys. But then you have to also understand, and, and Chris knows this as well, when you roll with the Japanese in the beginning, You'll submit them over and over again, but then you realize they give you that submission. So you're they they build a flow, like they go for an arm bar, and uh, like if I have an arm bar, they they kind of give it to you a little bit, so it, there's a flow, and then you have to let them escape, and they go into a thing, and then you escape, and it goes back and forth. Like I rolled with Sakuraba one time, and I go, dude, that's it, <laughs> you know, because I was submitting him. And then they said, somebody took me to the side and said, no, boss, this is not how they roll. He gives you those things. You have to flow. I go, oh, sorry. I, I, I don't know. So then I start doing the same thing. And it is. It's really cool because you see more things. It opens your mind up. So it's a nice thing. Well, well, boss, too, I just talked last time, I think, about, you know, I when I first went there, I, I went against uh, Yamami, and he, I was felt like I was dominating him. And I, I was a young guy trying to just, you know, show that I belonged there. And, and he, I would just submit him left to right and think he's, he's not that good. And then uh, we fought six months later and he didn't try to submit me. He learned all my submission moves. He, he was looking at this like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to learn his moves. And he did. And so I couldn't submit him when we fought and yeah. he beat me on like a majority of decisions. I'm like, man, he outsmarted me. You know, I didn't yeah. realize it then, but he wasn't, this is practice. He's not trying to submit me. He's trying to learn from what I'm going to do. And he, he beat me in that. So I was like, well, well played. He did it. So I think that a lot of gamesmanship, what they're, they're very smart about being tactical as well. Yep. Yeah. That's it. Completely set you up there. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> so Saki Kibara cried. Um, 
obviously you had a relationship with them. When did you know that Pride was in trouble? Well, when it came out that uh, uh, the Yakuza was funding it, right? Because once that came out, well, listen, the Japanese people, they know it's there, but once it's made known it's there, they will not support it anymore. So they lost their TV Tokyo, whatever the deal was, the biggest TV network they had, they lost that right away, they pulled out. You know, and then it became known, and then you know, yeah, the people start going against it. I guess I don't know. It, it, not a single person ever went to jail for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. <laughs> you know, like, I'm on the south side of Chicago. I'm on the south side of Chicago. Even I know just watching TV that the Yakuza is involved. Yeah. But now that somebody actually says it, even though everybody knows it, yeah, now it's bad. Yeah, that's that's what it is. That's the culture there is completely different culture. It's really weird. So once because they, if, if it's not out in the open yet, you can always say, "Oh, I don't know," you know. But if it's out <laughs> in the open, but you know the great thing is, and and, and again with Chris had that people who forget their wallet or their phone or whatever at the restaurant and they're freaking out, and we always have to say, "Don't worry." It will be there in the spot where you left it. And even if you come back two hours later and somebody else is eating at the table, your phone will be there. Or um, very rarely they take the phone and buy it, but it will be there. I've never had a person or even a wallet that gets stolen. You know, so they're, they're very good people. Incredible culture. Incredible yeah. Oh, yeah. culture. Yeah. So there was a report in 2005 that Fedora's management was negotiating with uh, you know, some of the pride lawyers and they were kidnapped by the yakuza did you hear about that i heard some crazy stories a lot of crazy stories too but uh, what, what happened to uh boss boone as well but i you know I, i'm gonna have to make sure i can i can say this on uh, on the tv but so, i got yeah. boss boone right here crazy <laughs> stories out there yeah, I'll ask. <laughs> yeah they, they locked the door to him too one time and they tried something then i do know but uh, i'm gonna leave it like that ask him he will tell you because he's okay. very good yeah, okay. I, I got a I got a more fight related question. Just just to, you know, when when you got to UFC and before that, you must have met John Peretti, who's a kind of eclectic figure John that Peretti a lot of people do not know about. But you were like a John Peretti, like he liked you, and not a lot of fighters can say that. Why don't you talk about your relationship with him? He came to Japan, and uh, as he was the matchmaker from the UFC, and they said he said he watched my fight. Where was the one was it? I don't know which one it was anymore. He watched me and when I dropped somebody and then after he said, hey, the UFC is very interested in having you. You want to fight for him? Yeah. Now, did, did you ever roll with him? Yeah, I've been rolling with him. Yeah, he's, a, he's legit. He's a good guy. But, but back from those days, because I, I know he is. I, yeah, from, yeah. You know, he no, was a guy that that was a big difference is he would jump in there and, and, and kind of like that was part of how he rated people. And, and like I really? said, he liked you. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he was, to me, he's always been very good. I mean, he gave me, he, yeah, I always wanted to go to the UFC because I knew a lot of people. Like, listen, if I wouldn't have gone to the UFC, I, I would have been known, but I wouldn't have been known as I'm known right now. And I knew that the UFC was going to open a lot of doors, like for if I want to do TV work, stunt work, whatever it is, you know, because that's just a show that's bigger, much more known than Pancras. I mean, only mm -hmm. the hardcore fans knew Pancras. So that's why I really want to go to the UFC. And I wanted, my, my main reason, and this sounds so stupid, I want to come up with the, UFC theme song, that old school. I thought it was such a badass song, right? I go, I gotta come up with that song one time. And I was literally one of the main motivators I wanted to fight there. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Here, you brought up the UFC. <clears throat> In your fight with Kevin Randleman, when you were kneeing and, and you know, elbowing from the top, did the Ebenezer Braga fight kind of help you come up with that game plan? No, 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 no. I didn't even know that. Uh, Ebenezer and Kevin fought, and Ebenezer used that same tactic. Oh, yeah? But was it? did he fight him before me or after me then? He fought him in Brazil. It was like his third or his fourth fight, and he had about 25 cornermen, and Mark he, and Kevin had Mark and I think Eric Smith. I, I During the fight, like he, Ebenezer's team was pulling him out of the ring to kind of get him in a better position. I can't believe there wasn't a riot there. Yeah, 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 this is crazy. Well, no, I just, I was uh, I was coming up with that. Uh, I came up, just came up with that, with the knees from the bottom and the elbows. 
like a week before. I think wow. and there is a moment when I knee him and he later said also the, because he falls on me. But I just don't realize I, you know, that he's dazed at that moment. And then he just kept continuing again. So yeah, that was a, that was a crazy fight, very close fight. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Um, well, you know, I mean, we're we're at this point in your career where you go on a 22 fight unbeaten streak, which is but I, I think something that doesn't get enough attention. Yeah, I mean, I know you're an old school guy, but you yeah. fought the best talent, including a rematch against Frank Shamrock in that bout, which was so close. It yeah. was such a close fight, man. Yeah, it's uh, that, the, the second time I fought it, Ben, you mean, yeah? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So was, but that's where I had him twice in the knee bar. What's that? You, like, co complete, I did actually a show, the Tales from the Car, it's on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, so you can watch it for free. And I talk about that, and you will see me going with those knee bars. I go, yeah, I don't, I don't know why they would break it up when I got a full-on submission there. So that was mm -hmm. kind of a... But yeah, you set a trap, and he bit on it two different times. Like, there was a movement that, that was very enticing to him, and he bit, and you would just go, whoop, and you would swing over and grab the knee bar. Yeah. And it showed your, your your levels in grappling. I mean, you're at a black belt level at this point. That that time it started all uh, working together. Everything started uh, falling together. And another great thing for them, that fight was, like I was always a big biohazard fan from the band. Uh, yeah. I could see them in Holland. Uh, <clears throat> they played at a Dynamo Open Air, which was a place two miles from my home. <clears throat> and uh, they called me on the day of the fight. And our show was during the day. And Danny, and I never met these guys. Danny, the drummer. So he calls me, uh, the telephone rings in my hotel. I say, hey, and it's, it's Danny. I said, dude, Danny, Danny, so, so. So from Biohazard? Yeah. I said, what's up, dude? And he goes, yeah, we're in Tokyo. I said, you're in Tokyo? <laughs> I said, dude, we're fighting today. I said, we're playing tonight. I said, you're, oh, this is great. I said, so we have a show in a couple hours. I can get you guys first row tickets. <clears throat> and then hopefully we can come back with the fighters. We can come to uh, <clears throat> you guys' show tonight. So she set it up. So they came to watch our show. That was the fight with Frank. And then afterwards, we went uh, to their show. And that's, I truly believe that's where I, I saved Frank Shamrock's life over there. Because <laughs> it started with Vernon Tiger White, always wanted to stage dive because they asked us on stage. And we're like, hey. And it was in the Tokyo Liquid Room, I believe was the name. And suddenly, freaking uh, Vernon is running and he jumps. Uh, stage dive and the people catch him but you know he's a heavy guy so he fell on some people and so now I'm going because I want to do this too and, I'm, Whoa. and I, I remember with my head I bounce up against somebody's head or with my eye bro so boom and he, I mean, he goes down so I, I grab him up I said oh show me my sense show me my sense so while I let him go he falls again so I just knocked the guy out or with the headbutt but I got a big scrape here <clears throat> So, which later, Guy Metzger, he went to get super glue at the 7-Eleven. They have him there also. And they, they just <laughs> But the second, what happened, I'm saying, oh, I'm sorry. And I see Frank. And Frank starts running towards the people. And not only that, he jumps on a speaker to get more height. And in the air, he flips, he goes backwards. And the whole crowd spread like ants. <laughs> and I start running. And I'm sliding over the ground. I swear to God, dude over the ground and he fall with his back on the ground. I caught his head in my hands. <laughs> and then he was coming from freaking eye. He would have splattered his head on the concrete. I literally had him just <laughs> on the freaking inch. I caught his head. That was crazy. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, why don't we close with one more Dutch question? Jan Plas. Jan Plas. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Died in prison. Um, he's one of the founders of Dutch kickboxing. He also was the main provider of security for the red light district. Yeah, Jan Plas is a badass, you know, but, 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 you know, also listen to him. Rob came and Miller Gurgley, Gilbert, I've uh, Gilbert uh, Valentin. Was it him? Yeah. Um, Oh my God! Who Valentin Overeem, Gilbert Ivo. It seems like you're yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the, the whole group from Giro Gym. They had a group at that time. Fred Royers also. He became a reporter. He's a really good reporter. I mean, all these guys were animals. I mean, they went to Thailand and they really started. They got their asses handed to them. I literally heard this from Jan Plas's mouth. That's what said how it changed 
because they with the kicks it went wrong and then they realized wait a minute if we use more western boxing and we follow it up with kicks i think we do much better and that's where they start beating the ties i was there at an event where four ties came over four champions they went to the Yap Ada Hall, which at the time, the name, that, that was the hall where all the big fights were. They were live streaming from Amsterdam to Thailand. And they got all got knocked out, the Thais. They never did that. Again. <laughs> that was crazy. That was so crazy. Andre Brilleman. <clears throat> you, you want to look into that guy. Andre Brilleman is a guy who was also on that team, but he was a crazy guy. And he got trouble with the mafioso, a big uh, Yugoslavian mobster in Holland. Ooh. And they, they faked, he faked that he killed somebody. He, they put ketchup on him. And, and he told the guy, okay, this is the only reason we let you live is because you give us the money, but I want you to leave the country. You cannot come back. Well, the guy decides to come back three months later. Oh. Ouch. Yeah, they found him in a, in, a, in, a, in a barrel with concrete with his legs sewn off, eyes were burned out and fingers were pulled. Yeah, he, uh, he didn't come very happy at his end. That's a big story in Holland, you know, that guy. But, dude, he could fight. There was a Thai guy who, uh, who started digging a hole, I believe, like in an imaginary hole, a grave for him. And he's walking over in the middle of the ring and he starts, like, the imaginary scent, he starts pushing it back in the hole. You know? <laughs> and he would have these combinations, always wrapping up with a low kick. And you would think by now that people could stop it, but the way he was doing it, yeah, he was really good. One of the best ever I've seen with that, actually. Like making combination, wrap it up with a kick. Constantly he would do that. That was a that was a Majiro gym thing anyway. Like Ernesto Hoost would do that a lot as well. So Jan Plas. Until, until they cut his leg off. Then he I, yeah, that, 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 I was going to say, Boss, I, I didn't know Holland was. I'm glad you're here, brother. It's dangerous over there. Stay away. <laughs> <laughs> so Jan Plas, he passed in prison, but there's I, I exhaustively looked online for things. And we had Marlo's Conan on. She said, I think it was like a, a heist for eels or something like that. Do you recall why he went to prison? I have no clue. I do. I, I heard from somebody that they walked into an apartment where he was present and every single room till til the, the ceiling was with money. So <laughs> that, but again, this is somebody who told me that. So yeah, it was a lot, apparently. So but you know how people are. So it could, could be every hearsay, could be that, but you know, it could have been, you know, through t-shirt sales. At, at, yeah. At <laughs> they found it. What? <laughs> Everybody was doing stuff. Maybe, yeah, maybe he collected the old guilders, you know. They went yeah. Oh, yeah, the way less work. <laughs> you see, that's a big difference. That's a big difference. Yeah. Pastor, well, you're an absolute legend, man. Absolute and we couldn't legend. thank you enough, man. Uh, what an amazing career. You just uh, 22 in a row is unbelievable, especially, you know, I always talk about you look at the guys in Japan and the record. They're upside down because they fought nothing but the best. Well, you did too, but you beat them all. <laughs> it's yeah. kind of amazing, man. So thank you so much. Oh, one of the uh, great fighters uh, of our era, man. Really appreciate it. I really 100 episodes. Thank, yeah. thank you so Thank you very much, much yeah, yeah. Russ. Thank I'll you. see you soon. Godspeed, brother. We'll see you see in it. Pennsylvania or wherever it is. <laughs> wherever they say, I don't know. All right. yeah. So, Boss Rutten, you know, the deep dive with Boss Rutten has started, and it's in the books now, man. What, a, what an amazing deep dive. Mike, where'd you go? There you go. Hey, what did you think, man? Amazing <laughs> stuff. I love Boss. He opened up a lot on that, that Dutch scene and uh, being in a restaurant and – yeah, they always say, if you're going to get involved in a murder, if you don't do it yourself, it's probably not worth getting involved in, you know, or even shopping it around. And, I mean, you heard him say it, like the guy walked in there, he had dinner at a restaurant or lunch at a restaurant, came out, guns a blazing. That was a pretty shocking re uh, revelation, you know, as well as Boss being on the phone with the guy, you know, right before his car blew up. Yeah, but what, what I found out, and this is interesting, is a little light humor, but you know what Boss is short for? I would never have guessed. Sebastian. Sebastian, yeah. Yeah, Sebastian, yeah. Yeah, it didn't cross my mind because Sebastian's are usually a guy you you make fun of. I think no, it's like, a, but this is not one you want to make fun of at all. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it came up Sebastian on his phone uh, ID first, so I changed it to Boss Root. You, uh, 
what was kind of shocking is, well, not shocking, but like we got to see the depths of Bas Rutten. We talked about Jason DeLucia and he took the high road. He's like, well, you know, I heard some things. First, he goes, yeah, nice guy. We're friends. And then I and then I said, well, Gary Meyer said this about him. Well, you know, you hear some things, but that's the past. I'd rather just kind of keep moving forward. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's true. You know, I, I think the, the fact is, is the Lucia, you know, I think he was there. If Gary is right, he was probably getting paid. And I think to a certain extent, every fighter from the old days kind of understands that. That hey, you know, to get your money, you know, when you can too. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, he wasn't he didn't kill anybody, he didn't do anything really illegal. He just played a little bit of spy, you know, among the fight and fighter camps and stuff. So if that's the case, you know, I I it's not surprising to me that you know boss forgives him. It's okay. You know, I what I what I also liked was that boss was very open about the fixed fighting in Japan. And how, like, he left and he's like, wait a minute, you know, they didn't ask me, stop the car, asked him direct. And he said, no, 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 we're not, we're not doing that with you. Um, you know, he, he's just a guy that, uh, he's like, anyway. Yeah, might not- they have a lot in common, but they're, they're like, they're like, they're not Dutch or Japanese or Hawaiian. They're like kind of international people. Like, like everybody understands them and gets along with them. Or I'm both or sides. Listen to yeah. yes, they're amazing people. Yeah, you're right. They have a lot of similarities in, in the way they attract people. Yeah, our Inuit interview, like I, I listened to it again. It's bonkers, man. Like there's there's a lot going on. <laughs> there's a lot going on internationally at this time. And I'm glad we're recording it with the people that were involved. I mean, it's our hundredth episode, you know, hip hip hooray, Miguel. You know, we made it. Um, but like uh it's little nuggets like the NUA, like the Marcus Davis, even like the newer guys like Ian Heinich, Matt Brown, like those interviews that the, the, the type of information that we procure is valuable to us, us diehards and hardcores. And it's truly an honor to, to be a part of that process. I mean, it, Chris allowing us to kind of use him as bait to lure people over here. So you and I can fulfill our I, sick I, fetish I, of, obscure information like, you know what i think i think i think chris has got some of our same proclivities i think he likes it I don't oh think for sure okay. i think we're using his name that bad you know what i mean it's yeah, not like for it's sure not like i left him a thirty thousand dollar bill at the casino you know what i mean but this is he's all right for sure, with this. For sure so, but no i thought it was great i thought boss was phenomenal i've got april 8th at 115 bourbon street on the south side of chicago i'm doing color commentary for a mixed martial art event there I've got April 16th in Orlando, Florida. I am hosting the Abu Dhabi Jiu-Jitsu Pro um, event. Please register through Smooth Comp. And the following weekend, I'm back in Minnesota with Ignite FC. So I got a, I got a pretty busy schedule in April. And uh, so do we here at the Lights Out Podcast. We'll be back. This is our 100th episode that's in the books. Thank you. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.